Welcome everybody. Uh, we've got our new debate, our big debate that we've all been looking forward to between uh, degrowth and green growth. And we've got two great speakers. We've got Yorgos Kallis, who has been done some central work on the degrowth agenda. He's got this book, uh, Growth of Vocabulary for a New Era. Uh, and then we've got Michael Jacobs presenting the green growth case. Michael has uh, spent a long time in government, was instrumental in setting up the Stern Review, is now heading the IPPR's Commission on Economic Justice. So, um, your gosh, you're going to go first, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving me this opportunity to have this interesting, I hope, debate. Uh, let me ju jump straight in and uh, try to give a definition of the growth and starting by clarifying some interpretations because the term, given that it sounds like the neg negation or the negative of growth, might give, the opportunity, might give the impression that what we are arguing for is negative growth or negative GDP. Uh, a core claim that we are trying to make in the degrowth community is that degrowth is not a proposal for just uh, reducing the GDP or reducing the GDP. That's not the core of the proposal. There are three core elements in, uh, that they are captured in this literature, in this debate around degrowth, and that we summarize in this uh, book that we published uh, two years ago. First of all, degrowth is first and foremost, I would say, a ruthless critique of the dogma of economic growth, of the ideology that is coming uh, 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 together with economic growth. Uh, the ideas that justify economic growth, but also the ideas that try to convince us that the consequences of economic growth are always good, they are non-negative. We can both uh, have an equal society and a, a environmentally sustainable society while continuously having economic growth. So first and foremost, D is a negation of this ideology, is a confrontation <laughs> of this ideology. Second, is a key word around which uh, we coordinate research for the search of alternatives. If we refute and refuse this one-way future consisting only of economic growth, what can we do? How do we manage uh, employment? How do we manage work? How do we manage uh, the welfare system that we heard yesterday from Max? How do we do these things in an economy that doesn't grow even more in an economy that might even uh, be shrinking? Finally, and here I think is the most controversial part and the part we're going to discuss more, more with Michael today, we are arguing that a downscaling of the economy is not, only, uh, is not only desirable in a sense, given the consequences, the negative consequences of continuous growth, but in a sense it's inevitable. And I want to emphasize this inevitable. We heard yesterday uh, the scenarios uh, with carbon budget uh, by Kevin. And and the future that is in, for in front of us was quite bleak. And I think in one sense or the other, uh, the economy is going to be smaller, let's say, one century from now. Is it going to be smaller because of a climate disaster or is it going to be smaller because of a prosperous way down? Uh, this is uh, the title of a book by Howard Odum written back in the 70s. That's the core argument of the growth. It's not let's just reduce the GDP is that the reduction of the GDP is inevitable in a sense if we want to green the economy and it's inevitable but in a very worst way let's say if we don't green the economy because it's going to be through a type of, uh, of collapse a type of uh, negative, negative, very <coughs> negative trajectory. So the hypothesis here is that we can downscale the economy, we can achieve a prosperous way down by changing certain things. Certain things sound uh, easy, of course, it's much more difficult than that. We are talking about serious social transformations, okay? That can make this downscaling path socially sustainable. Let me say a few words where, where I'm coming from, because where I'm coming from, as you can imagine, is very different from where Diane Coyle was coming from. And I think this makes a big, big difference, because sometimes we, we, we talk from different paradigms, and then it's very diffi difficult to establish a dialogue. So from the paradigm where Diane Coyle is coming from, and I think we didn't press her enough to hear her views about growth and whether it can be green. She said she agrees with Kevin. I was surprised to hear that. I wanted to ask her why she agrees, because I think hard pressed to agree that we would need to have some growth to reduce the carbon budget, she would say that she wouldn't agree. And why would she say that she wouldn't agree? Now I'm putting words in her mouth. It might not be kind. But I think like most economists, she would, she would argue that 
you don't have to have growth just by <laughs> growing the carbon intensive part of the economy. So she would argue, and she's famous for her work on the weightless economy, that you can have growth of the so-called weightless part of the economy, digital, digital economy, information services, communication, etc. And that this part, the growth of this part, can compensate for a negative growth of the carbon intensive part of the economy. Within the neoclassical paradigm, within the standard economic paradigm, this can make sense, of course, because GDP is an indicator that puts everything together, as we heard yes yesterday. Everything is substitutable and compensatable by everything else. And of course, in theory, yes, we can have an economy that grows and produces more and more massages or more and more, I don't know, language services, and this compensates for an economy that produces less industry. But we realize there that something must be going wrong with this with this idea that that's how the economy works. We know that the economy doesn't work like that. The economy is a complex integrated system with inputs and outputs. It's not that just some services can start growing and growing the GDP while something else that the industry that fuels the whole thing or the agriculture can degrow. Okay? The second part is that in growth theory, in standard growth theory, there is no place for resources. So some of you that might not have studied economics might be surprised to hear that. But in standard and conventional economics, the main factors of production are labor and capital. And new growth theories are talking about uh, ideas, innovation, social capital, human capital, that's far as they go. As we say in ecological economics, you know, you make cakes and you make uh, cookies in, with the oven and the workers. There's no fuel to fuel the oven. There's no flour to make the cookies. So. This is the standard pro uh, production function in economic growth theories when there is no, no place for, for resources. Now, ecological economics, where I come from, starts from a different, very different understanding of the economy. And it's an understanding that it's, by definition, biophysical. You might argue whether this is correct or not, but I'm arguing that this is the hypothesis of ecological economics. That the economic process is a process of extracting, processing, and transforming energy and resources into energy and resources embodied in products and services. So the economic process is a process of transformation of matter. That's a key contribution of Nicolas Georgescu Rogan. It's a contribution also that Robert Ayres is uh, continuously developing, and many ecological economists have worked on this basis. Services, the weightless economy that Diane would talk about, embody energy and materials. So this computer here obviously embodies energy and materials. Me as a professor, I embody all the energy and materials that they were used to make me a professor, to be trained, to go to the <coughs> university, to fly around, to go to a high school that was uh, using electricity in order to teach me, etc. All, all these processes embody energy. So to talk about services as something that is weightless, from an ecological economic point of view, I insist, doesn't make much, much sense. What is growth in an ecological economic sense? Growth is, the is first, of, first and foremost, the economy is moved by work, by the work we do as humans, and the, the work increasingly we don't do as humans, and we have uh, fossil fuels uh, doing for us. Someone used the metaphor of energy slaves yesterday, I think it was Rupert. It gives a little bit the impression of what this means. It means that, you know, when we talk about horsepower of an engine, and this is fuel doing the work of horse, or doing the work that humans were doing before. Of course, it can do much more than humans uh, could ever do. But this is the force that moves <coughs> our economy. And what is the process of growth, in a sense, is that we get surpluses out of this work. There is much more that we produce, much more work done than the products we get back as workers. This surplus is taken by capitalists and they invested into further growth and further work being done and further fossil fuels extracted. <coughs> this is what growth is all ab about. Now, ecological economists argue that growth fundamentally depends on the constant supply of, uh, of energy. And on, on a net supply of energy, what I mean is like energy doing the work for the economy to move. So for an ecological economic point of view, it's not surprise that GDP and carbon emissions go hand in hand. Because the industrial economy, the capitalist economy that emerged, let's say, and took off <coughs> in the 19th century, was an economy based on fossil fuels. It was fossil fuels that made possible this incredible and unique in the human history takeoff. It was not just fossil fuels. It were also the institutions of capitalism that made possible this quite unique and break in human history a process of taking surplus and putting it back to growth, taking the surplus that this, we were taking from these energy sources and fueling more growth. 
So that's, that's basically the process. But I think we have to understand the process to understand where we are. If we think of a different process, like the one uh, we might think from a neoclassical paradigm, then it's very difficult to make the kind of arguments that we are going. Who is right, of course? The question is open. I'm not saying that I'm definitely right, or we are definitely right, and your classical economists are wrong. But I think it's important to get the data right. And I think Diane Coyle, for example, yesterday kind of cheated with the data. She confessed it, but I don't think this, uh, this lets her off the hook. This is the, uh, this is the relationship up is in relative terms between GDP and uh, the material flows of the economy. Diane just showed you the red line, which is domestic material consumption. And uh, the blue line is uh, GDP. This is for the OECD economies, OK? She said it seems that there is some decoupling. The economy is dematerializing. Then she said, but I don't account for trade. OK, once you account for trade, you see that the economy is not dematerializing. Uh, GDP and material flows are going hand, hand in hand. She says the data is uncertain. Of course, the data is uncertain. The data for GDP is uncertain, too. So then let's not speak about data. But if we speak about data, let's look at the data that the best people who are working on this data are producing. And the picture they are showing is this one. Take it differently. This is the material footprint of nations printed versus the GDP. Again, you see a very straight line. The bigger an economy is, the more materials it uses. OK. I might be wrong, and this might change in the future. We keep hearing it will change in the future. We will dematerialize. We will decouple. Fair enough. Everything might change in the future. But on this way, why are we doing science about the past? Especially if you're an economist and you do econometrics. In econometrics, when I was taught econometrics, it was all about establishing causal relations that they were working in the past. To say, you know, we found the strongest possible causal relation of the past, but it will change in the future, or we can change it if we want, seems to me not very reasonable as an, as an idea of going forward. So let's talk about uh, green growth. Same picture, I saw the picture for material flows, but exactly the same picture works for carbon emissions and we know it very well. This is a relationship between uh, global GDP and global carbon emissions, almost one to one. There is some reduction in carbon uh, intensity, but at the scale of 1% per year, like a very small reduction in carbon intensity, okay? Some people are celebrating that 2015 was the first year that we had GDP growth without uh, increase in carbon emissions and without being in a crisis or a recession. That might be the case. It might be that carbon intensity is improving, but it's improving very, very slowly, OK? If it is improving at all. Same picture if we plot, again, uh, the GDP of countries with the carbon emissions of a country. 0.6 to 0.7 elasticity. This means 1% increase in GDP, 0.7% uh, or 0.6% <coughs> increase in carbon emissions. There are other factors, too, that affect carbon emissions. There are, but like the factor with the, that statistically most significant, the one that consistently in all econometric analysis, no matter how much you try to play with the data that we often play when we do econometrics, the only one that comes out always statistically significant is the scale of the economy in carbon emissions. Renewable energies, we have a lot of hopes about them. But if you do sta sta statistics on, on the past, you don't find a very strong <coughs> relation between renewable energies and carbon emissions. Why? Maybe because they haven't been deployed fast enough. Why? Maybe because renewable energies use fossil fuels in order <coughs> to be deployed in a current fossil fuel economy. So still, they are not decarbonizing the economy. The only factor that we know that reduces carbon emissions, as scientists, is GDP. So the idea that I talked I guess, a little bit yesterday with Mark Sagoff when he talked about becoming more and more productive, and he made the example that Robert Solo, when he heard about the Limits to Growth report, he said, oh, our economy is becoming, our labor is becoming more and more productive because of technologies, so our resource use can also become more and more productive uh, because we develop new technologies. And I, I asked him, I repeat this for those of you who weren't, who weren't here, I asked him, yes, but economists, when they say that they the economy is becoming more and more labor productive, they're not saying that labor is being reduced. Because this would be like accepting that new technology creates unemployment. They are saying that over time, employment increases. Why is employment increasing? Because we have growth. And this makes sense. Precisely the same argument for resource productivity. As we become more and more resource productive, uh, we save surpluses that we invest in further growth further economic activities that employ more resources. Precisely for the reason we don't have unemployment, we don't have also unemployment of resources. We don't save resources by becoming more productive or by becoming more efficient. We are using more and more resources in the process of growth. 
That's not a paradox. It is called the Jevons paradox. We call it the Jevons paradox because Jevons first noted that by becoming more efficient in the way we were producing energy with the steam power, we were saving energy resources, but instead of that, we were using, we were using more and more coal. He said, why? Because we become more efficient in the use of coal, the price of coal gets cheaper, so we end up using more coal. <coughs> this was a paradox. No, I don't think it's a paradox. That's precisely what capitalism does, and it does it well. It makes more new technologies that makes labor and resources <coughs> more and more productive, and precisely for that, it creates growth. What does growth do? It uses more labor and more resources. That's the process that e e eco-modernists, or how I call them, post-environmentalists, try to tell us that will save us in the future, and somehow we will start using less resources. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know if it makes to you, but it's really hard to, to understand where the argument goes. The other argument is that we can substitute. The other argument, key argument that has come out of economics is that, you know, yes, some resources get scarcer, some resources are more polluting, but we can substitute the dirty ones for, uh, with, cheap, uh, with uh, clean ones. This is the picture of global energy con consumption over the years, okay? Constant growth of energy use. And what you see is that we are not substituting any energy source. What we are doing is we are finding new energy sources and we are adding them on top of the already existing ones. So this is biofuels, this is biomass, which means wood used for fuel. It hasn't been reduced, it hasn't declined even after the discovery of coal, after the discovery of oil, after the discovery of natural gas. What we have is a system that keeps expanding and keeps adding new energy resources. And this system, the way it works, continuing to work like that, what it will do is add also renewable energies on top of that and keep growing. There is no reason to expect that renewable energies will substitute oil unless we actively work to take oil out of the economy. And that's a very different process than the natural process of the system. It's not the natural process that eco-modernists are celebrating. And they say, naturally, we always substitute. Of course, naturally, we always substitute, but we keep the substitute with us. Another, uh, John, it will help me if you tell me the time, because I feel I'm going slower than I'm, I should have been going. <coughs> <coughs> Another core argument that we make in ecological economics is that we don't have to look just in energy supply, but we have to look at the energy return of energy investment. What does this mean? It means that in order to produce energy, you use energy. So in order to drill oil out of the earth, you use some energy you know, to bring the machines, bring the bulldozers, excavate and take the oil out. Okay? Coal and oil are particularly unique sources because the energy return that they give on the energy we invest is extremely high, or was extremely high, for oil is declining. So a core argument here is that renewable sources, yes, because they're going to they're gonna reduce carbon emissions, etc. But the problem that we have to be aware, not necessarily a problem, but at least the challenge that we have to be aware is that renewable energy has a much smaller energy return on energy investment than fossil fuels that drove industrial revolution. What does this mean? It means that we're going to have much less net energy available for the economy, much less net useful work that is being done for free for us from uh, energy. What does this mean? This means that we're gonna, if we follow the ecological <coughs> economic model, that we're going to have, again, an economy, if it was going to be an economy that was based on renewables, we're going to have an economy that it's going to be much more labor intensive again. So up to now, what we have done is we've had plenty of high, high energy return fossil fuels, and this has substituted human labor. If we're going to an economy with low energy return energy sources, we're going to have to do again more of this work. Is this good or is it bad? It might be good in the sense that it provides employment, but it's going to be employment that can buy much less in terms of energy than it was buying now. This is a type of ideas and the uh, hypothesis that we are grappling with in the growth literature. How would an economy look like where we would have less energy to go around and we would have to do much, much more of the work? Could it be a pleasant economy or is it going to be again a, a feudal peasant economy? <coughs> and let me find with a final blow to the idea of growth because as I said, this is first and foremost a ruthless critique of the idea of economic growth. So we have to remember that compound growth sounds very innocent. Now you say 2% per year, yes, healthy growth, moderate, reasonable. It's called also low growth. So this low growth of 2% per year means that the economy has to double every 35 years. It's a simple division 70 by 2. I learned it so that I can do it quickly. 
So 70 by 235. So an economy 35 years, two times bigger. In uh, 70 years, four times bigger. <coughs> 105 years, eight times bigger, 16 times bigger, 32 times bigger, in infinite times bigger. That's the idea of compound growth, that you have something that's growing up to infinity. That's logically <coughs> impossible, no matter what this something is, even if it's weightless and has just a little bit material, give it enough time and it will go to infinity. That was the basic critique of the club's, uh, Club of Rome report. That was the basic critique of Paul Ehrlich to population growth, etc. It's an illogical, it's an illogical hypothesis. So if it's illogical, we have to think how the, the let's say, the landing is going to take place because this thing is impossible. Of course, we might want to dig our head in the ground and say, yes, but for 50 years more it's possible and it probably is. But the question how the landing will take place is always there and one generation has to be brave enough to address these questions of how the landing is going to take place. Here's just some back on the envelope calculations. So many times we talk about uh, <laughs> carbon emissions and growth, but about in the future, no? We are saying uh, with this carbon intensity reductions, then we, we won't have to have the growth, no? If we reduce intensity like 10 or 14% per year, then we can have 0% growth or 1% growth. But let's put, let's say, let's turn the table around and say what would have happened in the past if we had more growth or less growth? Because in the past, we know more or less what carbon intensities we've had. Of course, carbon intensity could have changed if we had more growth and we had invented technologies faster, or it could have been slower, depending, depending, okay? But I think it's a fair assumption to say that from 1990 to now, not that big of a change would have <coughs> happened in, uh, in carbon emissions just because of different growth rate, okay? Or different, uh, much big difference in renewable technologies. So these are the calculations. If the growth rate was 1% higher, what would have happened? So we would have used 1% lower global growth per year since 1960. We would have used 300 gigatons of carbon emissions less. We would have emitted 300 gigatons of carbon emissions less with historically observed carbon intensity rates, okay? 1% higher and we would have uh, emitted 442 gigatons of carbon emissions. If we follow Kevin's analysis that the carbon budget is anything between 590 to 1,200 gigatons, this means that by now we would almost be at the two degrees Celsius uh, situation in terms of climate change. This would be just with 1% growth more each year uh, for these past years. You go to 2%, starts becoming an old wild assumption because with 2% you would have a very different economy, but the calculation you see escalates. 1,000 gigatons more of carbon emissions or even 2,000 if you go to 2% more, okay? This is just to show how important the growth rate is for carbon emissions. Of course, we can make hypothetical examples that we have 100% reduction in carbon emission uh, intensity and then the rate of growth is irrelevant, but that's not the point. The point is the reality, the, re the reality of the economy as it has worked up to now. There are many other uh, advantages that a lower growth rate or less growth would have compared to, for example, a strategy even of renewable energy, which, uh, which I'm, I'm in favor. <laughs> With renewable energies, we know that there is also the problem of rebounds and leakages. You have more renewable energies, the price of fossil fuels goes down, you use more fossil fuels. You have less growth, <laughs> this doesn't happen. You cannot have uh, offshoring. For example, with renewable energies or with very stringent climate policies here in Britain, the industry goes to China, you, you, you bring your products uh, from China, and then you, know, you have very good climate policy and carbon emissions in England, but if you, if you put the imports in, you're using as much or even more uh, carbon as before. With less growth, this doesn't happen. There is less growth, less production, and less consumption, so less less carbon emissions overall, less carbon emissions in your country and less carbon footprint. Another problem that I didn't hear in Kevin's <coughs> presentation, but I think it was raised in the discussion, is that investing in re renewable en uh, uh, energies in an economy that is fossil fu fuel would burn a lot of fossil fuels. We don't know how much because we haven't done the calculations. But if we were to go to 100% electrification, Imagine that we start now to put an electricity grid everywhere. What would we use to fuel all the works, the construction works that will be necessary to do that? We will use fossil fuels. We don't have already an electrified system. So this means that we will burn a lot in the transition, which I think <coughs> is very problematic, and it's even more a core argument to say that the growth rate is, is important. 
Remember that the growth rate doesn't affect only carbon emissions because here we are objective climate change in this workshop, but it affects all other environmental pressures. So the only benefit is not just carbon emissions, it's a reduction of all other environmental pressures. And it's a reduction of all types of emissions because renewable energies only, uh, only reduce the emissions of factors that uh, they have to do with the energy system. A reduction of the growth of economic activity typically reduces a little bit of everything, also of agricultural production, also of all types of emissions. And finally, as I said, <coughs> in an economy that is green, I hypothesize that this economy, by definition, will have to be a smaller economy. So if we prepare for a smaller and downscaled economy, it's more likely that we can integrate renewable energies within our economy. If we keep going for an economy that has to grow, of course, renewables fall out of, of the picture. They fall out of the picture because they have a high cost, and at least initially, they act as a break on growth. Of course, you might argue in a Keynesian, in a Keynesian way, yes, we can <coughs> have a stimulus based on renewable energies, and this will circulate money and will relaunch the economy, etc., etc. But the core question there remains uh, biophysical, and it's can the energy return of these sources be sufficient to maintain an economy of the current scale? If I am right and they can't, this Keynesian stimulus can only be short term. You know, Keynes said. You can just dig holes and pay people to do that, and this would be good for the economy. But it's not going to be good for the economy forever. If we just dig holes and, and cover them, this wouldn't maintain a sustainable economy that keeps <coughs> growing. So the important question is, like, investing in these renewable sources can keep a growing economy. My hypothesis is it cannot. But it's not a problem for me. But it is a problem for a society that is based on growth, because we have to plan and prepare and think of how do we manage an economy without growth. How much time I have, uh, John? Because I don't want. I think I made some core arguments. Five minutes. Yeah. Five, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Let me see on which criticism I can focus. So one argument uh, against. Uh, slowing down of the economy is that it will backfire. So, for example, there is the argument that we might have a regression to dirty fuels, we'll have less investments on renewable energies when we most uh, need them, and that the stagnant economy means also stagnant technological development again when we most need it, right? First of all, let me no note that in an economy that slows down, it's not only investments on renewable energies that are going to slow down, but also dirty investments, investment in fossil fuel industry investments on the construction sector that builds skyscrapers, etc., etc. So all these things are declining. Uh, which ones will decline faster? This is a matter of policy, I believe. Uh, whether it will decline more the investment on the clean, clean technologies or the investment on dirty technologies. Again, taking the historical record as our basis, negative growth decreases emissions one way or the other, decreases them by 60 or 70 percent for a 100 percent uh, decline in the economy. So no matter what happens, it does decline them. I mean, and that's, I think that's the core, the, core, the core message. Let me note also, and I made this comment yesterday too, that technology has pro progressed a lot since the 1960s. The economy has grown several times. <coughs> I will need some water because I'm going to lose my voice soon. Can I have some? Yeah. Thanks. There's some cups up there as well. <coughs> so the economy has grown several times. It has grown seven times, I think, or so since the 1960s. That's that's a that's a that's a huge that's a huge uh, huge increase. But global carbon intensity has remained almost the same. So there is no direct link necessarily between the growth of the economy, the rate of technological change. <clears throat> and the actual change in what most matters for us, which is the deployment of renewable energy. And I think as engineers tell us, we already have the technologies that if we deployed them, we would already reduce carbon emissions to the levels we want. <clears throat> so it's not so much a matter that we need more and more innovation, more and more new technologies. We do have what we have, but we are not using it. Why we're not using it? because it's not profitable enough for those who control the economy and because it might not create the growth that those who control the economy want. So precisely the, the, the challenge is how to change this system and deploy these technologies, even if they are unprofitable for some, or to change how the whole technological system works and how it, uh, it, 
in the rewards, for example, uh, technological innovation. We heard yesterday from Michael Sagoff, uh, sorry, of Mark Sagoff, the best thing I took from his presentation was the example with DDT and, uh, and CFCs. He said they were phased out because the patents expired and the industry didn't want to keep them. That's like the level of irrationality our system has, you know? So when the industry didn't have patents and wasn't making money from DDT, it said, okay, better bring the environmentalists in to, to help us take it out and get some new patents. Uh, this, is, this is an irrational system and a system, so within the degrowth community, we have discussions about what sort of technological system would we have in, a, in, a, in an economy that doesn't have growth. There is a lot of interesting ideas coming from the commons community about uh, open source uh, software, open source knowledge, changing the intellectual property rights. These are the discussions we have to have now. And these are the discussions that an interdisciplinary community seriously concerned with the challenges that Kevin put yesterday about a limited carbon budget has to have. How do we change the technological system? Not making the argument over and over that, you know, in order to have technology and technology growth, we need to have economic growth. Because I, I think this is not also supported by the past, or at least the past up to now. The other argument, which I think is a reasonable one and the correct one, is that economies that do not grow, capitalist economies to be more precise, that do not grow, uh, are bent to collapse, no? They are bent to be unstable. Sure, they are bent to be unstable, but they are not necessarily unstable. So we, we this is, uh, okay, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what it is because I'm running out of time. But basically this shows that <coughs> uh, in a country like Spain, uh, a 1% reduction in the GDP re leads to 1% increase in unemployment, okay? In a country like Spain, uh, like Austria or Japan, on the other side of the graph, you need to have a 10% reduction in the GDP to get 1% reduction in 1% uh, increase in unemployment. Okay? So this shows that there are countries with institutions, with labor market institutions, that can handle the question of employment without growth. What do they do? I don't know because we don't study it. This is an IMF, re IMF report. Dan O'Neill uses this figure. I took it from Dan O'Neill. It's an IMF report about the relationship between uh, growth and unemployment, they don't talk at all about it. They say, oh, some idiosyncratic factors down there make these peculiar cases of Japan and Austria. No, the question is precisely what do Japan and Austria do so that without growth they manage to maintain employment? What sort of institutions would we need in a society without growth or with negative GDP growth in order to maintain meaningful work? In the degrowth community, we are talking and we are studying work sharing. We are studying the idea of a basic income. We are talking about changes in the taxation of income, in the taxation of resources. I'm not saying that each of these are panaceas or that they are silver bullets, no? They have problems, so changing the working hours has problems. But it needs to be studied and it needs to be discussed. It needs to be politically discussed and it needs to be discussed in terms of research. And I find it extreme that the only people who are discussing that is a relatively marginal but growing community of people who are contrarians to the idea of green growth. Uh, so finally, I mean, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here, is that you might argue that this is politically impossible. And I think you would be right. I mean, the way we are heading, it's politically impossible to imagine a kind of a transformative, downscaling, transformative political project first is very difficult to imagine. And second, it's two times more difficult to imagine a transformative political project that would be coming with the idea of smoothly downscaling the economy or uh, facilitating a prosperous way down. So politically, to see where would this come from, it's really, really difficult. So I would, I would <coughs> accept that. And I would concede that. But I wouldn't concede that we have to stop talking about it because then we make this pessimism a self-fulfilled prophecy. So I think we have, first of all, to stand with a diagnosis. Is the scientific diagnosis of what I'm making here correct or not? If we accept that it's cor correct, and I don't think we should adjust the diagnosis to the politically possible, to say, you know, I'm gonna say that green growth is necessary, as we heard yesterday uh, from Mark Sagoff, we heard that there is an iron law of, how did he call it? Apparently, Pil Pilke Jr. launched this term that I don't think it will give him the Nobel Prize uh, in <laughs> economics. The iron law of policy, that whenever a growth policy confronts an emissions reduction policy, it's the growth policy that always wins. Yeah. And that's the iron law of politics. Okay. Uh, 
politics doesn't have iron laws, and this we know it. Uh, this we know it very well. You know, before the French Revolution, you wouldn't imagine the French Revolution. If you made an iron law of politics before before the French Revolution, it would be very difficult, different from if you made it after. So in politics, at least there are no iron laws. In the universe, there are iron laws. In the biophysical, <coughs> in the biophysical economy and how it works, there are, there might be iron laws. But in, in politics, there are there, there aren't. Nothing is a priori politically impossible. But I do realize that it is as difficult as it gets. Speaking of such a downscaling of the economy. Uh, but I would, I would insist, if we agree on the diagnosis, then we can discuss what could be the political strategies for some of these ideas to start influencing things, start influencing social movements, start influencing political circles, start influencing political debates. But we have to agree first on the diagnosis, because if someone tells me I don't agree with your di diagnosis and I think we need economic growth or that economic growth is compatible with greening, then we're not going anywhere because we don't, we don't agree even on the starting point. If we agree on the starting point, then we might discuss on how far we can go with that or what we can do with it. So to close on a pessimistic note, because I think the days uh, merit a pessimistic uh, note at the end, and I think Kevin's presentation yesterday was quite pessimistic. He tried to make it optimistic, but he didn't convince me <laughs> on, the <opti> on the optimistic <laughs> side. I think he should have finished pessimistic. It seems we are heading for two degrees Celsius and most <coughs> more than likely four degrees Celsius. And it seems really difficult to have the type of uh, fast, Kevin argued, fast deployment of technologies, very unlikely within the time framing that we, we care. And then he ar argued for fast deployment of social technologies, like social changes, uh, changing on the way we, we use energy, changing on how much energy we use. Again, if we were to be honest, there is no, there is no prospect for fast change on that front either. So I think we are heading for two degrees <coughs> Celsius, and this most scientists who were interviewed last week, 10 out of 10 said we are already there. So now we are talking about four degrees Celsius. So this puts a question of what kind of world we are creating. The economy will adjust to this world. So the economy will collapse, and then again we're going to have carbon emissions and GDP, if we are still around to measure it, going hand in hand. Uh, but the question is what scenarios of transformation do we imagine within the world that we are already creating or, uh, um, or have uh, created? Okay, I'll leave it there and I would say that uh, John, uh, you gave a title to my presentation that I didn't choose, but by the way, I'm just going to publish a book <laughs> with that title, which is not a book, it's not an academic book, it's a collection of essays that I wrote, I have written the last two or three years, so it's a little bit less rigorous than what I presented here. It's more opinions and pieces that I wrote in newspapers and blogs over the years. It's going to be out in two weeks and it's going to be free. So. Uh, I will circulate it around, but keep an eye on it when it comes out. Thank you. So, uh, can I have the water back? Is that, ah. is that yeah. or just the bottle, or something? <laughs> is it somebody else's altogether? Yeah. I'll just take a little bit of it. Uh, there's only a I bit left. Right. Um, so, I. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> the resource limits are hitting the cooker. There you are, that can go back to you. Um, so, uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm really sorry I wasn't here yesterday, which means that I missed Kevin's uh, uh, contribution, although I suspect I know more or less what he said. Um, uh, and, he's, and he's right. Uh, it's really a terrible situation we're in. I didn't hear Diane Coyle, although I've uh, read lots of her stuff, and I, uh, I didn't see Mark Sagoff. So um, I'm conscious that I'm coming into a debate um, kind of in the middle. Um, uh, and I apologise um, if the various things that I'm going to say have either been said before or have already been uh, refuted. Um, I have a, uh, some remarks, but I'm going to abandon them and do something slightly risky. John said, do you have any slides? Uh, and I said I didn't. So I want to use uh, George's slides. 
Um, he's laid down a challenge, uh, it seems to me, to people who believe in green growth, of which I am one. And the easiest way of addressing that challenge is actually to take it on in the way he has constructed it. So if you don't mind, I would like to use your slides um, and uh, to try and show why I disagree with almost everything, not everything, but almost everything he said. Um, but starting, I suspect, from exactly the same set of objectives. And this makes this debate really important, which is that uh, I'm not going to speak for other uh, people who defend green growth. I'm going to speak for myself, although I think a lot of people who are in my position do share this, uh, although we will all be different. Um, I think tackling the climate crisis is our number one economic priority, and more widely actually tackling the, the uh, sustainability <coughs> crisis more generally, because climate is by no means the uh, only environmental um, problem we have to deal with, and in my view it's uh, among the easier ones. You'll be pleased to hear that. Um, the, uh, uh, and so that is absolute priority. The second absolute priority is justice, um, which I know is part of the subject here, and we live in an incredibly unjust world, which is uh, in some respects, not in all, becoming more unjust. Uh, not in all, we need to be uh, careful about this. In China, many, many, many poor people have been lifted out of poverty over the last 20 years. That's true in other developing countries. Um, and so on and so forth. But I definitely accept that uh, uh, it should be an economic priority to reduce inequalities. I also think, not as high a priority on my list, uh, that the way in which we generate well-being, or we think we generate well-being, in modern capitalist economies is pretty crap. Um, we don't do it very well. And indeed, it does seem to me, and I think that the green analysis of the historical periods here, is that we've become worse and worse in, it, uh, in Western capitalist economies that if you look at the evidence on uh, perceived living standards as well as objectively measured living standards, there was a long period after the war when people did feel that their life satisfaction was rising. There were lots and lots of problems with that model. And in around the mid-1970s, uh, the evidence does suggest that capitalist, Western capitalist <coughs> economies became worse and worse at doing it. And people no longer felt as if their living standards or their quality of life, their life satisfaction, the various kinds of measures that have been made have been rising. And it does seem to me that we live in a, in a, in a very bizarrely constructed economy now in which we produce an awful lot of stuff and we generate very little benefit, net uh, social benefit out of it. Um, and so I start with those three kind of political value-based priorities. Um, and, uh, but I want to focus on the first and to some extent the second. I'm going to leave the arguments about, uh, uh, about well-being uh, to one side. So I don't know whether, do I, how do I get back? Do, was there a clicker or um, are we just using these? Yeah, fine, yeah. let me go back to, uh, it's great to have slides done for you. Um, so, um, so let me, I, I want, so I want to focus on, um, uh, we could come back to the justice and well-being arguments. I want to focus on the core relationship between environmental damage and climate change and economic growth. Um, so, this is uh, a slide I agree with, um, and I am not a neoclassical economist. Uh, my book, my first book on this subject, The Green Economy, written as far back as 1991, um, was uh, an attempt to show that the kind of neoclassical environmental economics, which at that point had begun to emerge into the public domain, uh, David Pearson uh, uh, and so on, was fundamentally misunderstood the, the, the philosophical nature and indeed biophysical nature of the natural environment and its relationship to the economy. And I completely accept the ecological uh, economics approach based on Georgescu Rogan, which is that the biophysical economy is a, uh, that the economy is fundamentally a biophysical uh, uh, process and that it is the process of extracting uh, energy and materials from, uh, from the natural environment and of creating value out of that. And this is really, really important. This is where um, I want to emphasize something that uh, 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 has not been emphasised so far, and then inevitably that energy and those energy and materials have to return to the natural environment in some form, not in any form, in fact, but in an entropically more disordered form, and that is the first and second law of thermodynamics: you can't create or uh, or destroy energy and matter, and the process of entropy creates disorder uh, unless you apply external energy sources uh, to it, of course, and that's another crucial point that is uh, was missing from the account earlier. That is, uh, I don't think this is a question of choosing between neoclassical economics and ecological economics. That's a fact, 
and that is what the way in which the, uh, the universe works. And the economy is very well described, it seems to me, as that process. But you have to remember that the middle bit, which is what the economy does, is create value out of that flow of energy and resources. And GDP is a measure of the value that is created out of that, uh, those processes. And GDP is a measure of the, uh, of the value that human beings, in the slightly bizarre but nevertheless now well-structured way in which we run an economy, um, judge things to have value. And it's monetary value, so if we did most of the things in the economy without money, without exchange, as we do some things, uh, a lot of care goes on outside that, then that's not measured in GDP, in which case GDP is really not measuring what's going on at all. So there are real problems with this. But when we talk about growth in economics, we are talking about GDP growth. And GDP growth is some measure of the value that is created and the activity that's created out of those processes. But it does not get rid of that fundamental the process. So um, I am fundamentally uh, in agreement here. However, let us remember that the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy law, does not say that within a system you can only ever tend to entropy. Because if you apply energy into that system, so you increase the energy flow, you can reverse the entropic flows. And that's broadly speaking, what we have to do in, uh, in our economy. And the reason we're able to do that is because our economy is not bounded in its energy sources. We do not rely now, and we do not have to rely, on the fossil fuels that are embedded in the human economy. We can now rely on the external <coughs> sources of energy provided to us by the sun and gravity, normally through wind. And this is really important in the thermodynamic understanding of the economy. Um, that the core climate problem we have at a biophysical level is because we powered our economy for 200 years and we continue to do it, 80% of, of energy in the world economy is still fossil fuels. Through the embodied energy in fossil fuels, which is inside our system and not part of the external environment, we are generating CO2 that is disordered and in a sense climate change is a, is a wonderful example, terrible example, of entropy at work. We don't have to. We can power this economy through renewable resources of various kinds. And that is key to the whole uh, green growth argument. If we couldn't do that, if we had no ways of mobilising vast, vast amounts of energy that come into the, uh, uh, the, the human world from outside, then we would have the problem that George just describes. And the interesting thing about other environmental problems we face is whether we can find ways of generating value that do not rely on resources um, which cannot be sustained in the environment. And I think land is actually our much, much more difficult problem. And species extinction because of population growth seems to me to be a much more serious problem for people like me, green growth, than, uh, than, uh, than, than climate change. But it is really important to recognise that solar and gravitational energy, of which there is, uh, there is unlimited amounts, are ways of powering the economy and value, and value creation, without generating that, those, uh, those carbon uh, effect. Now we will go on to our ability to do this quickly enough in the time scale and so on but that is uh, the, the biophysical basis uh, of the argument. So um, what do I want to say just uh, uh, through these um, the historical record is absolutely unequivocal there is no question that capitalism as we have experienced it has been based on the use of fossil fuels, which creates our, uh, our climate problem, but also the extraction of many other environmental resources and their uh, deposit back into the environment in extremely careless, let's say no more than that, ways, in which we've not basically harvested the, the resources in any kind of sustainable way and we've deposited them back in ways that create pollution, degradation of water and climate. The historical record is absolutely unequivocal. And George has argued here with this slide that. Um, green growthers were somehow saying that the future world could be in somehow different. Well, yeah, we are. But his argument is also that the future world has to be different because he's saying GDP now has to go down, which is an even more different thing. His future is even more different than my future, which is that you get some flattening out and then decline of the material throughput. So we are both arguing about a different world. None of, neither of us can sustain an argument that the world is going to be like it was before. And my argument is absolutely not based on saying there is some inevitable process. I didn't hear Mark Sagoff. I'm absolutely astonished if he 
is now saying that there are some kind of natural processes in capitalism which generate decoupling and which generate technological innovation which then reduce environmental impacts and so on. I think that is a bizarre thing to say um, because all the experience we have now of doing this is that it's done under huge intervention within the economy. We've not got renewable energy occurring now really on a very significant scale. More renewable energy now being added to the power system around the world than fossil fuels are being added to the system. This is a very <laughs> serious thing that's now happening. We have not got that through some natural process. We've got it through intervention at policy. And the nexus between policy and technological development is really important to recognise how this works. Yes, now solar power is sweeping the world because... Uh, uh, because the price has come down below the price of fossil fuels and it's now economic within the capitalist system and people are making money out of this. Brilliant, in my view. That's not because some natural process. It's because Germany introduced the feed-in tariff in the early 1990s, gradually introduced solar power way above parity with fossil fuels. That generated a market. The Chinese then got into the market partly because they wanted to do some of this themselves, partly because they had the scale. They built the scale. That reduced the price and now we're gone. This is the nexus of technological in, uh, innovation with policy. Anybody who thinks that there is some eco-modernist idea that all of this happens naturally <coughs> is mad, in my view, absolutely mad. And in a sense, this is my crucial first point that I want to put across. The kind of world that I want to bring about is brought about through political intervention and policy. It's not in any sense a natural process. So these, this historical record, I completely agree with this. I want a different future, but so do degrowthers, and they, in my view, want a much more radically different future, one in which the growth rate uh, falls as well. So I am perfectly happy with uh, the historical uh, analysis here. So um, I will uh, try and do something in this, but in reverse. Um, so uh, this is true historically. There's absolutely no uh, question that this is true historically. But over the last 10 years, we have started to decouple CO2 emissions uh, from GDP growth. There's a very obvious reason for this, which is the biophysical reason. We've been using fossil fuels to do this. If you do that, you get climate change. We get So that's, that's uh, completely agree with that. The question is, can you decouple economic growth from CO2 emissions? And that has been happening. The, um, the, uh, the, you had here, let me come, I think, which, which one was it? No, no, maybe I'll go back. Um, so um, the, uh, the, the point was made that um, you referred to uh, Diane Coyle and, uh, de, uh, and the uh, decoupling of uh, CO2 emissions from growth in developed countries, and we've exported some of that. So the record is that we have very significantly decoupled growth now from, from uh, CO2 emissions in developed economies. If you add back in all the imports we get from other countries, it is a lesser rate of decoupling, but it is not a negative rate. And there is a very simple reason for that, which is we are using energy more efficiently and we are using more renewable resources, although we barely started down uh, that path. If you, if you look, we've got uh, now about 20 to 25% uh, renewable energy in our power system, almost none in our heating system, almost none in our transport system. So we have gone hardly down this path, but we have started on that path. There is a rebound effect, so yes, Jevons is right. Uh, Jevons is absolutely right. There is a rebound effect. If you, make, uh, um, uh, if you become more efficient, you reduce the, the price of a the good, then you use more and so on. But the rebound effect is smaller, empirically, than the reduction effect. So yes, there is a rebound effect. This, this uh, system doesn't, uh, uh, does have a, a negative feedback. But we are doing that. And of course, the interesting thing now is China is doing it too. And China is, of course, the test case of all of this, because, frankly, what we do in this country is, is almost neither here nor there. It's very important politically, but in terms of the global uh, impact, the real uh, uh, test is China. And China is going to be the... Uh, uh, and China does look as if it's now flattening CO2 emissions, rather remarkably. We can't really rely on Chinese statistics uh, particularly. The one that I particularly don't agree with, I think that the CO2 and coal ones are pretty reliable, are the growth statistics. And I think the reason that they are that CO2 appears to have flattened in China over the last two years is actually their growth rate is almost certainly less than the publicly stated growth rate. But that's great. Uh, that's a good thing um, because it is definitely helping um, uh, China flatten emissions. And if we could do this, so if we had a situation where, because China is also now rapidly investing in renewable energy and becoming more energy efficient uh, uh, and so on, we were able to flatten the emissions profile, you would see a global decoupling. And that's what the models... Uh, suggest. And that's the argument. The theoretical argument is that we can decouple growth and CO2 emissions. 
Now, there's a question of scale, and I want to come to that in a second. But the potential, the technological potential and the economic potential within a capitalist system to decouple growth and CO2 emissions seems to me now evidenced. Scale, let's leave scale uh, for the moment, but we can do it. And we can do it for a very simple reason to understand, which is that we don't need fossil fuels to generate energy. We need them right now, absolutely. We can't do it all by renewables, but um, increasingly we're seeing how we could use renewables for more or less all uses of energy. And those technologies are, coming, uh, are being developed under policy uh, under policy uh, incentive um, gradually but you can see it in power now particularly as storage comes in you can see it in uh, how heat could be uh, uh, um, mostly through, through electricity and you can see it in transport I think there are lots of other let's leave other environmental uh, factors aside but that is clearly technologically uh, possible and it's beginning to occur and the decoupling is, occur uh, is occurring uh, despite rebound effects and so on and it simply isn't good enough to say because history has been like this therefore the future has to be like this if we we know that if we carry on like this it's a disaster we have to change very very radically and green growthers come in all stripes and there are some green growthers who didn't want to change things very much actually they are looking for very small incremental changes. I am one of those who's looking for very, very significant change because I understand the scale uh, of the problem. But the history is not a guide to either of our futures. We've got to change this history uh, very, very radically. Um, so this is... Uh, um, uh, let me just take a sip. Um, I think the... Um, at this point, I think, making my... my uh, 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 notes about this um, that uh, George has said at this point that um, I think when we get to compound growth this is the point that this is logically impossible which um, uh, is it, this is uh, true remember <laughs> what we're talking about if we were talking about resource use or CO2 emissions the problem is very early on this the problem is right down at the bottom uh, on the left hand side of this if you're talking about GDP which is what I'm talking about when we're talking about growth, then the problem is not is a completely different one. Um, because GDP is a measure of the monetary value of what's circulating in the economy and how we value it, and is not intrinsically related to the resource and material flows. And the second crucial point that I want to make is I'm really not very interested in GDP. I think it's a poor measure of the things we want in the economy. It's a very poor measure of well-being, of justice, and all of those things. And for me, the first prior economic objective is to constrain the economy within the environmental limits set socio-politically, but based on a biophysical understanding of the economy. And this seems to me to be the, 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 the crucial policy finding of an ecological economics position, is that if we don't want to... Uh, exceed the environmental limits that the biosphere provides for us, we have to constrain the economy within them. And that's the prior first goal. My question is, my, on the point that uh, 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 I make as a green grocer, is firstly, I, to do that, you do not want to talk about GDP. If you focus your attention, as the degrowthers do, on GDP you are missing the point of the natural environment and its impacts because these things are not correlated in an easy way. And what I don't understand about the degrowth position is why people who care passionately about the environment and about well-being are focused so much on something that is at best a weakly correlated, theoretically weakly correlated proxy for it. For me, if we want to focus on climate change, we need to focus on emissions and how we reduce them and how you constrain the economy to not generate more emissions than you want. And I don't care what happens to GDP in that process, in the sense that that is my priority. So GDP seems to me to be an odd thing to fixate on when, you're when you should be focused on the physical world and your constraints, the constraints you need uh, on the physical world. And, um, and I want to make this argument more, 
um, stronger in a second by focusing on the politics. But just in terms of policy-focused theory and so on, it seems to me GDP is neither here nor there. Um, and uh, I am quite happy to accept that within a constrained economy, the GDP growth rate might be slower or lower than it would be in a, in a fossil fuel-based uh, economy. Absolutely happy to accept that we are probably heading, in my kind of world, for a lower growth rate than you would have in another one. To be perfectly honest, it's a lower growth rate for a short period of time, since a high growth rate is going to bring us catastrophe quickly. So over the long run, it's not a lower growth rate. And those comparisons of long run, of the costs of growth in which including the IPCC did. The IPCC said that what would be the cost of a green economy, of a carbon-constrained economy, out to 2100 and produce some, some differential in the growth rate. It's absolutely absurd. Totally, totally absurd. A, you can't model that far. We have no idea. B, in what possible world you could generate uh, growth <coughs> rates uh, of, those, of those kinds without paying attention to climate change. I'm absolutely happy to say the growth rate might be lower. I'm even happy to say it might be negative. I think it's quite possible that in order to constrain our... Uh, economy at um, to within sustainable limits, we might have to experience negative growth rates. But I am not focused on doing that. And if we could do it, if we could do that and have positive growth rates, that would be a good thing. Because in general, growth gives people more income, and that gives uh, and income has a whole variety of goods. So we've really got to ask: Why is it that there is this fixation not on material growth, which we should be fixated on? We should be trying to reduce material growth, absolutely, way much lower, particularly in energy. And why are we fixated on GDP growth? Um, so this is an interesting, um, uh, this was an interesting slide, I thought. Uh, and this takes us, in a sense, to the heart of my, uh, the, my uh, political uh, argument. Um, let me first just make the rest of that argument about, uh, about GDP growth. And this is very important uh, ecologically, if you go back to the ecological economics. If you have a, if you focus on trying to reduce the growth rate, trying to get a smaller economy, you don't necessarily solve your environmental problem. Um, and so not only, so, and this seems to me to be really crucial to this argument, an economy contracting at 2% a year is not a sustainable economy. Um, there is no guarantee that any particular rate of growth sustains your Natural, your use of natural resources within the limits that the biosphere can provide. So a carbon intensive economy that is declining at 2% a year will almost certainly produce more carbon emissions than we can naturally sustain. And certainly one that is extracting fish or trees or whatever and declining but nevertheless extracting them at a non-sustainable rate relative to the sustainable harvest rate is not a sustainable economy. And that's because there is no relationship between growth, uh, between GDP growth and the natural environment. Now, it's certainly easier in, in a theoretical sense to reduce your environmental impact if your GDP is lower. Absolutely no question. So the smaller the economy, the, more, the easier it is to do that because your rate of environmental, uh, technological improvement and, and your rate of uh, improvement is going to be less. So there's no question that theoretically the growth rate is, is important in this. I have to say population growth is much the most significant element here in, in global growth rates. Global growth rates have been driven by population growth much more than they have by the technological uh, rate of growth. So, um, which is why, so I completely accept that if we had a smaller economy, but in itself a smaller economy does not meet your environmental limits. And this is why I say don't fixate on growth because you need to be addressing the actual sources of your environmental degradation, which is CO2, in, uh, land uh, loss, and, uh, and so on. Um, so, uh, and you can, uh, we've seen this in the past, we've seen economies which are not growing and which still cause tremendous <coughs> environmental damage. The Soviet economy after 1990 uh, declined uh, in size, but still produced tremendous amounts of CO2 well beyond its uh, 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 what you would now say was sustainable. So it, what I'm asking for is a focus on the, on the actual things that we want to, um, uh, to change. And this is where George has got to, a, um, I think, an interesting uh, point about, um, uh, about the degrowth argument. Um, I presume he's on the left and I'm on the right here. I'm, a, I'm in favour of renewable energy and, and climate change policy. And I agree we have to do all that. Um, and so I completely agree that you can't do little bits of it here or there. <laughs> You've got to do all of this. And it's got to be international, which is why we have a Paris Climate Agreement. None of us are trying to do this uh, uh, 
uh, only domestically. Um, I think this is the hardest, and I think uh, the biggest challenge to the position I take is whether you can simultaneously constrain all the different things we need uh, to constrain simultaneously. Um, but we certainly have to do all of these things. This is a radical transformation in the kind of capitalist system we have now. There's absolutely no question that dealing with this, dealing with climate change on its own level and all the rest, is a radical change in the kind of climate system, uh, capitalist system we have now. The question, in my mind, is whether it is completely impossible to conceive that we could do this within a capitalist system, democratic societies of the kind we have now, which um, look not too dissimilar from the kind we have now, or you need to move to a completely different kind of society with very, very different kind of economic structures, um, different kinds of ownership uh, of capital, uh, and so on, in order to be able to achieve this. This slide suggests that at a policy, at a, at a sort of technological level, we're in the same place. We know we need to do these very radical things. We need to run the economy technologically very, very different, differently. The question is, how do you do that? And for me, this is the most important <coughs> philosophical question of all. It's a question that is deeply pragmatic in form, and I'm going to make this argument of the case. But for me, this is a deeply philosophical question. Because if your conclusion is that, in my view, in order to achieve what we want to achieve, you have to move to a society which is fundamentally different in almost all respects from the one we live in now, then I think you are giving in. And I think you are conceding that it is impossible to act in our present world, and we will give up on any possibility of holding the world to 2.1, 2.2. 2 and remember, 2 degrees is an arbitrary threshold. It's an arbitrary number, and it was an arbitrary choice. 2.2 2, uh, degrees is not safe. 2.1 is slightly uh, worse. 2.2 is slightly worse than that. These are all probabilities anyway. We have to try and do whatever we can to constrain our economy to generate temperature limits. And that feels to me to be philosophically, morally, our overriding duty. And the core of my argument about degrowth and green growth comes to the feasibility of doing these things in the world we live in. Because we have not got long. We have the next 10 to 15 years to make this radical change, to reduce emissions to anything close to what Kevin said yesterday uh, are needed. Anything close, but the closer we can get, the better. And that has to be done now. It cannot wait for some change in the whole nature of our politics, our society, uh, and so on. And this takes me to my final point. And it is a pragmatic political one, but I don't want to kind of limit it in that sense, because I think it's our, for me, it's our philosophical, uh, uh, it comes from the philosophical um, claim on, uh, on, our, uh, uh, on our morality. Which is, um, I think... Um, Yeah, which belongs in this sphere. Um, I think if you look at our chances of reaching Kevin's, uh, anywhere near uh, the requirements that Kevin has set out, um, in the real world that we live in, uh, you've got to say that <coughs> the degrowth strategy uh, is a very, very long shot. Um, it doesn't look as if it will attract the kind of public support or the political support or the support amongst the owners of capital to have any impact on the actual world that we will live in for the next 10 to 15 years where we have to do this thing. And green growth looks as if it might do. And we've got some evidence for this, which is that the change in those historical pictures that were put up here of this global economy in which GDP and CO2 emissions are inextricably linked has occurred in the last 10 years, and that's the period that it's occurred in. In those 10 years, we have begun to install renewable energy technologies, do various other things uh, technologically and within the capitalist system uh, in such a way that we've got the first bits of decoupling. Nowhere near enough, but we've started on that process. And we are now on an accelerating process. So that process is accelerating, and it's accelerating almost everywhere in the world. An extraordinary triumph of Paris was to get every country in the world at least committed 
uh, to this path, and even and at least acknowledging of where they needed to go, which was phasing out fossil fuels altogether. Rather extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary commitment uh, that countries made in Paris. Now, only a piece of paper at this stage, but nevertheless, much more progress than we've ever had before. How has that happened? That has happened because people have been arguing for and accepting the arguments for green growth. And it is, in my view, the political discourse around green growth which has led policymakers to feel confident enough that they could sell to their populace, to their populations, to their business communities, which are incredibly powerful, a different framework for energy policy and now gradually for, for other things. And that discourse has been instrumental in the slow, inadequate, but nevertheless now started shift of technology and uh, energy policy, and now slightly more widely over the last 10 years, which has generated a little bit of improvement. And when I look around the world now, I see no governments, absolutely no governments, who are interested in degrowth and who think that that is the way to improve their CO2 profile. I see lots and lots of governments who are using the language of green growth and who are building coalitions of support amongst renewable energy against fossil fuel energy for example, in the business community. How do you get policy change? Having been in government, I can tell you how you get policy change. You get policy change when there's just about enough consent in the outside world for what you want to do that you feel you can get away with it. And the way you do that is by building coalitions of support. And what you've seen over the last 10 years as this process occurred is that the business community, half of it, in fact more than half now, has come alongside all this stuff because more people are making profits in the capitalist system out of green stuff than are making profits out of fossil fuels. And why is it that America has now gone down the solar route? It's because there are now lots and lots of jobs in solar industries in the US, and they are a bigger lobby, they were a bigger lobby uh, than the fossil fuel over the last eight years, and now you've seen, of course, a set time. Um, but this is a political process, and a political process in the world we live in now, and it's having an impact. And my argument, the overwhelming argument I want to make, is that degrowth is just not helpful. I think it's a very interesting subject to be discussed. I think all the questions that George has raised about how you might do it, which are kind of acknowledgement that there are problems, that it's difficult to do this, that basic income has some problems, that reducing hours is difficult, I think those are absolutely true, which is one reason why they have very little traction <coughs> in the wider world. I don't think nearly enough thought has been done about that, but I don't blame degrowthers for that. I think it's a really important area of discourse within the philosophical community, the, the academic community, and within people interested in it in society. I think it's great the Green Party and others are looking at this. But do not mistake this for a political strategy to change the world in the timescale we need to do it now. And that, in the end, is the critical point. I don't think you can conduct philosophy in a vacuum. I don't think you can conduct moral and uh, political debate in a world of your own invention. I think you have to do it. I think we all have to do it in the world we're living in now. And I think deep, the green growth argument gives us a chance of doing that, and I'm afraid I don't think the deep growth one does. Thank you. <coughs> right, I'm expecting you to queue for questions. <coughs> I think I have a bit of a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, so if you want to respond to each other. <coughs> yeah, I can say a few points. <coughs> it's gonna be here and there. First of all, let me make <coughs> clear that I'm not arguing against the strategy of uh, renewable energy, phasing out fossil fuels, creating coalitions between workers and environmentalists to push governments to do all these things. So that's not my argument, okay? I'm arguing that all these things are important, they are super important, and they are <coughs> a, a main area where we should put our political forces. So what Michael has done is, uh, is very important, and his work he has done within the government is very important. So I'm not, I'm not denying the importance of any of that, okay? I'm not naive and I'm not living in a world of my own imagination. I understand how the real world works. But at the same time, I think it's really important to have a diagnosis if we believe in it and if the facts, the, f the way we see the facts believe it, that uh, this is how things are, that we are loyal to that. So as I said, the political strategy we use given the, our analysis of the situation can differ. I'm not arguing, uh, even in the current uh, municipality of Barcelona that it's as radical as it can be, and that's the best thing I could ever imagine happening politically, I wouldn't tell them to go out with a strategy that it's uh, explicitly in the name of big growth, okay? That's, that's not my argument. But my argument is, that at least there is this diagnosis in the background and then you do things knowing that 
you share at least a common understanding. And you know, for example, that if you're in Barcelona, you don't want to expand the economy at all costs. You don't want to bring new hotels necessarily and more and more tourists. You don't want to have 2% more money for, uh, for hotel owners every year in Barcelona because that's what they want. And then you develop different policies, different sorts of tourism, different sorts of uh, arranging the city, etc. Within a diagnosis that what we want to create is a different, smaller economy, more convivial, but there is a, a different imaginary. So how do you do that politically? It's, 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 it's much more tricky. But what I'm arguing is not you know, to go all, all front and say like what we need is uh, less growth. But we need to start from a diagnosis that recognizes, and here we disagree slightly, uh, recognizes <coughs> that economic growth and ecological uh, sustainability are incompatible. I would argue that Yes, we both imagine very different future. You imagine a future that would be technologically, technologically very different. I imagine a future that would be socially very different. And both of them are, are, are hard in this way. But I would say that in terms of the biophysical part, I'm a little bit closer in the sense. In what sense, I would say. OK, that if this, the second graph is true, and generally, the rich, the wealthier economy is, the more material it uses, the more energy it uses, the more fossil fuel it uses. This means that logically, the smaller an economy is, the less of this it would use. So that doesn't have to do with the historical record. It has to say that growth, growth, GDP, and material use or carbon emissions, they go hand in hand. So if they are to decline, they're going to decline hand in hand. <coughs> so in that sense, it's not, it's not a break with established uh, causal relationship of the past. I am within <coughs> an established causal relationship of the past for the future. So yes, this, the, the upper graph will look very different, but will look very different in a way that it's established causally in the past. So I'm not the one that will say that what the past is never changes. You know? What I'm noting though is that it's a very like pick and choose uh, situation to say that in this established causal relationship, suddenly you say we can change everything, while in all other kind of established causal relationships in economics, you say that this is how things are and this is how we should go about them. Uh, <coughs> my problem is that the green growth discourse, or whatever is done in the green economy discourse, renewable energies, etc., that they meet their limit precisely when they confront the, the challenge of economic growth. So I think it's a false strategy, even for those who are, who are in support of, uh, of the green economy, to couch the strategy in terms of economic growth. But we do couch it in economic growth. So I'm fine with you when you say I don't care about economic growth. If that was, if that was your approach, for example, in the in the public and policy sphere, I would be fine with it. You know, to say like I don't really care what happens to to economic growth, and I think it might also decline. You said that, no? So. To that, I would agree. But when you couch it in terms of economic growth, of course, what happens is what happened to Obama. You know that he tried a green stimulus program; it didn't seem to work very fast. So then he started backtracking because he needed to create growth. And how do you create growth fast? You might create growth fast, unfortunately, the way Trump is going to create it. You know, building bridges, pouring money, and making highways because that's what creates growth. So when you couch your strategy in terms of growth, the people who can bring growth faster and dirtier, you give them also the argument for doing it. It's very different if you say, you know, we want to build a green economy, and we accept that this green economy might be very different, might be smaller, it might not be an economy of GDP, it might be an economy that GDP declines, but that's not a problem. Okay? So my emphasis is not to say that we have to decline the GDP, but we say that <coughs> we are aware of a transition <coughs> to a green economy that will create a very different economy that also might be smaller. No, I'm not saying also it might be smaller. So my diagnosis is that necessarily and inevitably it will be smaller. And then there is a huge challenge of how you manage that. Because we know that right now capitalist economies cannot manage situations of recession. Most of them. Japan has kind of managed them. But most capitalist economies cannot manage them. <coughs> so avoiding and evading this question, I think, defeats also our, our purpose of renewable energies, I would say. Because if we were to go the renewable energy, and if I'm right, we would have to confront a situation, perhaps also of recessions or perhaps of an economy that's stagnating. And we would have to be ready to manage this type of economies. But right now, both left and right, both, I would say, the Labour Party, to the extent that I know here, and the Conservatives, are not confronting all the Democrats and the Republicans in the US, are not confronting this situation. I haven't heard anyone saying, could we perhaps have some policies that would let us manage without growth? Could we change the labor market in a way that it would be sustainable without growth? 
could we do something different in terms of basic income or in the way we tax income or we distribute income to have a more equal society without growth? No, it is, we need growth at all costs and growth is gonna solve many of these problems. And I think this creates a huge practical hurdle for a transition to a green economy, if that's what we care about, that's not the only thing we care. But if that's the main thing we care, it creates a huge, a huge, uh, a huge hurdle, because in a sense the iron law of Pilkett Jr. has a point there, because when you confront, when you confront lack of growth, and it's like either we go for renewable energy and climate change, or we go for growth, growth in that sense is going to win. Why you, if you create a political or a intellectual discourse, that it's like growth, like, like you, you said, Mike, you know? Like growth doesn't, doesn't bring, but I don't really care about it. Mm -hmm. um, then, it makes it makes at least uh, the transition much much easier, I would say. <coughs> we are fixated on GDP growth because society is fixated on GDP growth. So, right now, economy societies are still fixated on GDP growth. If society was not fixated on GDP <coughs> growth, the the, the growth uh, critique would lose its. Uh, would lose its importance. So it's not a fixation because we think that that's the most important thing in general, but because that's the most important thing right now in policy discussions, and right? because we think it's the most important hurdle, uh, uh, hurdle in tradition. And I think it, it still needs a radical, uh, radical critique the idea of uh, uh, economic growth. Let me leave it there and see what people would say. Then. Can I can I pick up on one point? Because yeah. there are everybody in the audience, wants, I'm sure, wants to, to, to make points as well. Um, uh, it, it just just very briefly, a couple of points. Well, the, the main one I didn't make um, is about whether um, a strategy of. Uh, so I accept that theoretically, the less growth you have, the easier it is to reach environmental limits. But there's but I don't think that helps us in the slightest, and that's just a mathematical fact. Um, I don't think that helps us in the slightest because in order to get in emissions down, we need to invest in different technologies and uses. These are not brand new technologies. I agree with you, most of the technologies we've got are available, not all of them by any means, not all of them by any means. And investment does not, is not promoted in a GDP declining economy. Investment needs demand, and the owners of capital, and it'd be lovely if we lived in a world in which we shared capital and we were all in social control, that would be fabulous. Not, the owners of capital need rewards to invest, unfortunately. And that is less likely to be true in an economy that is declining in GDP growth terms. So I don't, I actually do argue that growth in that sense is necessary in order to get investment <coughs> into the things that will bring uh, uh, emissions down. And this is, so you've got a choice here, in a sense, if you like, you can say we're going we're gonna, to, we're more likely to reduce emissions at the rate we need by going for a degrowth strategy, which we have less investment, um, because it won't happen in, a, in, a, in an economy that's declining, and we'll try and get emissions down through our degrowth. Or you can say, no, let's go for different uses of energy. Basically, we need to get rid of fossil fuels. Massive, massive investment. In trillions, 90 trillion over the next 15 years, the Global Commission on Economy uh, thought. Um, and that's the strategy, in which case the growth grows because it gets that, in, it's much more likely to get that investment, and that's, that's what we see, simply the way. So again, living in a real world uh, in which capital holders need to be incentivized to invest in things, you need very, very strong policy that pushes them in that direction, but you also need an economy that is generating uh, rewards for them, and my belief is empirically, you will get emissions down much, much faster by a massive investment in those things than you will by trying to reduce the growth rate by a little bit, which will reduce emissions rather slowly. The other point I'd just like to make um, uh, about picking and choosing, um, uh, I think we really disagree here fundamentally. Absolutely, I want to pick and choose the elements of the capitalist economy as we know it now, and uh, because I think getting rid of all of it, changing all of it simultaneously is a really difficult thing to do, whereas picking and choosing the technological ways in which we use energy is a relatively manageable thing to do and is possible. So yes, I'm absolutely guilty of picking and choosing the bits of the capitalist economy that I want to change, but I think it's a much, much more likely to be a successful strategy than trying to change the whole lot uh, simultaneously. And the last point is, is, um, uh, is a kind of concession, because I'm interested to see how far we could uh, get to kind of some kind of agreement. I can see lots of areas uh, of agreement here. Um, I, I, uh, and and I, you picked quite rightly, I think, when I said I don't care about growth. And I think 
Uh, the strongest point you make is that green growth um, is, becomes a justification for any kind of growth. Because we emphasize both green and growth, and we do do both, you know, we're not saying growth at all costs, I never ever say growth at all costs. Nevertheless, that can be easily heard as, well, growth is really important, so we'll do the growth bit and we'll leave the green bit aside. And that seems to me to be a, a, a quite strong counter-argument to me, that green growth has been insufficiently um, uh, uh, clear, green growth has been insufficiently clear about the fact that growth without the green is really not on. And we have given sucker, in a sense, to people who decide, you heard green growth, well, I've heard the growth bit, and I'll call the green bit. So I think that, and how you build coalitions around that, and how we do that, I think is absolutely right. Uh, uh, and so on. So I'm willing to concede that. But it is my view, and most green growthers would argue for a much more widely defined strategy in which growth is, a, is not the crucial part of it at all. Yeah. Right, so yeah, okay, uh, there's already a queue before. Um, and can you give your name, please, and can everybody speak up? <coughs> so, is there any chance of getting some water? <laughs> water. Uh, that scarce resource. Um, if, you, if you don't mind a basic approach, if you get the toilets out there, you can drink the water out the tank. There's, there's, there's cups here. So if yeah. people just want to go and get some water from cups out of the... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's another... Uh, out of the tap. Yeah, and as you say, can we give some water? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So you want to start with me. Okay. So how shall we do this? Maybe take uh, four or five, and that's probably as much as we can manage in one go. Rupert. There's another one. Michael? Michael. Elka. Elka. Elka, yeah, of course. Well, that's, yeah, let's, let's stop it there for the moment. Okay, so Hayley. Thanks. Thanks for such a stimulating debate. I really enjoyed that. And I think this is a model to emulate the idea of using the other debating slides. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> it's a way to really to make sure we're honest and we're talking about the same the same data. Um, so I was um, pleasantly surprised to hear, you know, quite a, a few points of, of agreement. And I think uh, one of the there are a couple of um, points of um, disagreement that I wanted to pick up on. And one was one that you bracketed, Michael, which is to to say that you're not going to address the question of scale. So you acknowledge that we have already started making some, um, some achievements on decoupling, um, but let's set aside the question of scale. But I think the question of scale is one of the points of disagreement, um, because to say that we've already achieved some <coughs> of decoupling um, is to talk about the relative decoupling, whereas degrowth advocates are really interested in the question of absolute decoupling, and you have to talk about scale um, if it depends on what your time horizon is. Um, and if you're talking about a long time horizon, then you have to be concerned about absolute decoupling. So perhaps you can say a bit about that. The other point that I wanted to pick up on, um, a source of disagreement, is that the current system is worth sustaining. And you talked about the idea that there is not um, public and political um, appetite for any kind of radical change. And I think that's highly questionable. Um, we have seen with Brexit and with the election of Trump that there is massive appetite for, um, for radical change. And I think now is the absolute time that we need to have radical alternatives coming from, from the left and alternatives that offer positive ideas about how the world could be different because we're seeing that people aren't happy with the status quo. We can see you know, um, epidemic levels of um, you know, mental illness, obesity, um, inequality. I mean, is this a system that we actually want to sustain if we can just make it a bit a bit greener? I would say that uh, I don't think so, and I think there are a lot of people that don't want to sustain the status quo. First point I'd like to make is picking up on the way that the two of you both uh, said that uh, we don't really like uh, talking about growth, we're not really that bothered about GDP. So doesn't that suggest the virtue of an alternative rhetorical strategy, which is that that we favour in Greenhouse, which is not green growth, not degrowth, but post-growth. Isn't post-growth, post-growth, the framing that actually best says, let's just leave it behind and move on. Um, picking up on that, that thought of leaving it behind and moving on, um, didn't you let the cat out of the bag slightly, Michael, in your remarks about China, when you said, 
China's growth rate is probably less than they declare. And then you say, that's great, because it's reducing carbon emissions. Wasn't that quite a substantial yes. uh, concession? Uh, and towards the end, you, you said explicitly that you are happy to see growth rates go negative if necessary. How do you respond to the argument made by Kevin Anderson and made with detailed uh, economic modelling by Peter Victor and Tim Jackson that it is necessary? That there simply is no economic model whatsoever that shows us staying within climate safe limits while the economy continues to grow. So shouldn't you accept that case and allow that, while it might be true as you say, that in principle so-called green growth might be desirable, it simply isn't possible. Um, Michael, was that it? Oh, no, this no, one. no, 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 that's Michael, sorry. Yeah, again, thanks to both of you, fantastic event. Um, I'd like to, um, my question is more to Michael, and, and I'd like to focus on the Paris Agreement. It's a, it's a point that's been touched upon before, but maybe I can, sort of, um, I can make this point in particular a bit more explicit. So I think I agree with almost all of, of what you said, basically. And in particular, you say you don't particularly care about GDP, so all other things being equal, it's fine if GDP goes up because it gives people more income. But the, sort of the, the primary goal is to sustain sort of our basis of living and not trashing the planet, and then GDP comes second. However, I wonder, in Paris, how many of the countries that signed up to this would share that sentiment? And, and for how many of the countries, in fact, would, would Greg Trump, um, Trump so, you know, saving the environment or, or the planet or, or you know, sort of comporting ourselves um, sustainably? And the risk that I see is that sort of that narrative around green growth um, sort of allows either either side to go away and be happy to maintain their view of things. But but the risk is that the, the crucial debate then doesn't take place in the political sphere because because um, so that that equivalence may not hold or, or that green growth narrative. And I found it baffling observing in Paris to how dominant that narrative was. I mean, to put it bluntly, it was, there was this dominating narrative that basically Google and Richard Branson will save the day for us. And, and I don't know, I'd, I'd like to underpin this as well with um, sort of, um, David Cameron's speech in the opening ceremony. So he said, for example, I mean, he had this, his theme, his hook line was, what's so difficult about this? And he said, how can we argue that it's difficult, so I'm quoting him, when in London alone there's five trillion of funds under management, we haven't even really begun to generate the private finance. And he said, um, um, how can it be so difficult that we agree over what we must be sure delivering the things that we said we would deliver here? And what's so difficult, what's so difficult, what's so difficult? So, so this green growth um, sort of narrative, apparently, to David Cameron, um, suggested that it's quite easy, right? We'll go for green growth and we don't have to tackle the difficult question. And, and I feel there are very difficult questions and, and they're not being tackled and, and maybe there's a risk in, in that narrative. Tim. Um, yeah, thanks very much to, to both of you. It's really stimulating and as Lily and others said, lots of agreement. Um, and I think there's agreement that, that we need a radical change to the current economic system and that it should be one which, which prioritises um, how the economy can, can to one within environmental the limits, which still delivers uh, social equity and social justice. Um, so I think, and, uh, so there's agreement there. I mean, my, my questions, and I think some of the others, to, to, to George, us, I think, responding to, to, to Michael's point, which is the, I think, the strongest argument for green growth, that, that we need growth for investment in renewables, and, and I think it was slightly dangerous to say degrowth versus renewables, because I think, you know, in, in any sort of future, if we're going to be within you know, reasonable limits, two degrees, three degrees, you know, we need a massive investment in renewables. We need a massive transformation of the economy. So it does, it, it does need a massive investment. And you know, it's hard to see how that can be achieved without green growth, at least in the short term. And again, question to Michael is, is that is well, can we deliver growth in the long term based on renewables? And, and the danger of the green growth being becoming, as Peter said, a sort of techno fix argument that, that we can just do it all with technologies and we don't need to worry about looking at consumption issues and, uh, and what 
was argued that, that for climate change and for other environmental issues, you know, we need to address the wasteful consumption and, and the, the green growth argument kind of like to not Okay. Okay. So the main point I'd like to contribute is, or I'd like to talk about root causes of the problem. So I think, to me, the analysis would be very bluntly is a bit too shallow. So I got I got re a real frustration with the whole limits to growth, post growth vehicles discourse because this emphasis on growth as the main problem and driver of things, and this is where I agree with you that I think this is, to me, it's no longer a sensible starting point for the discussion because growth is an emergent property out of capitalist dynamics. So it emerges out of dynamics of competition, technological innovation in the pursuit of profit, division of labor within the firm, within the nation, across nations, the, the, the question of, of trade. This is how the system is organized and how it works. And what, what's the end of the capitalist story is growth as an outcome. And I find it quite strange to take that as the starting point and driver of the debate. Why does this matter? Because you derive very uh, different policy suggestions depending on the starting point. So if you start from growth, what you end up with is policy suggestions. We need lower growth, we need zero growth. Uh, but even the people who are advocating for growth don't have the power to just get the machine driving. It's not, it's not something that you can just, it's naive to think that you can stop it and it's naive to think that it's easy to, to generate it. Uh, so what I would call for is really a deeper reflection on what what is it we actually need to talk about? <coughs> Competition, profit, the political economy. And this is what you said also, um, um, Michael. You said it's deep, it's a political process. And you talked a lot about feasibility. But actually the analysis you presented was a very technocratic view of it's technologically possible and there are good economic reasons for that to adopt. And I, I don't, uh, I don't think it's a technological pro question. I think it's a deeply political economy question. This is what we have to understand. This is missing from your analysis. So I think it's much more about values, ideology, power, politics, and beliefs. And this is missing in both of your presentations. Also, you, George, just <coughs> started to lay out degrowth is more about criticizing the dominant <coughs> ideology. And it's not about questioning growth. But all of what you presented afterward was about GDP and what about the correlation with, with resources, which is a contradiction to how you started off your debate. Good. Okay, let's, I think, <coughs> let Georgos and Michael reply to some of those before we take any more questions. There's quite a bit built up there. Do you want to go first? <coughs> yes, let me start with her again. I agree. I agree with uh, with what you're saying. So I fully agree that growth is a, is, a, is an outcome of capitalism. So we didn't have growth in any previous civilization or kind of organization of the economy. It emerges with capitalism and its fundamental uh, outcome of the capitalist system. It's not it's not just a goal. It's, uh, it's the outcome of competition. It's the kind of division of labor. Uh, the kind of technological advances capitalism is running after. I tried to introduce that a little bit with the face of Zemos, but it might not have been the best moment to talk about it. But I, I wanted to talk about it. But I think <coughs> I have, sometimes I have to choose the audience and where to focus. So today I knew that I was going to confront the green growth argument, and I wanted to focus on why I think some data uh, from ecological economics confronts the green growth argument and shows uh, its limitations. So I focused, I focused on that. That's why I showed this presentation that was much more about uh, green growth. But uh, like, let's say, a, ref a refusal of green growth rather than a kind of diagnosis or fuller diagnosis of where the theory of the growth is coming from or how do we understand growth as a process or what sort of alternatives we are, we are imagining. But I have to make two points there. The first point is I still think that growth is an important variable to focus, even if you follow like a political economy understanding of capitalism, because growth has become a variable of interest within the capitalist system that it has its own dynamic. It might have been an emerging property, but right now it is a variable to which, for example, policymakers are focusing, companies are focusing, policies are designed around. So it has, it has become a reality, even if it was a reality that didn't exist before the capitalist system. And I think it's an important leverage of change for the capitalist system, if we want to change it. 
It's an important leverage of critique of the capitalist system, and it's an important point for when we can start having, thinking about concrete alternatives rather than you know, generalized alternatives that we need something different. If you start thinking, for example, about basic income, about uh, sharing work, about changing property regimes uh, towards a common, uh, common man management of resources of intellectual property rights, all these are changes. You might argue that they are reforms within capitalism, but the system that they will create will be very different. Will be a very different system that in some sense might overcome, might or might not overcome, some of the basic dynamics of capitalism. So to go for a full confront critique of capitalism and say we're going to do something completely different also doesn't work for me. It works for me to think also of concrete leverage points that might change the system and might create something new after. Capitalism also, when it emerged, it didn't emerge as a total vision. We want to create a capitalist system that <coughs> supersedes feudalism. You know, there were concrete changes here and there that created what today we understand as the capitalist system. So I guess I agree with your diagnosis that we have to create something that is different from the capitalist system, but I think this something will have to change with concrete changes right now and the problems we recognize. And one of the problems I recognize, but it's not the only problem of capitalism, is the, the incompatibility between growth and, uh, and the environment. Um, <coughs> about the dominant narrative, you didn't ask me, but I want to say that that's precisely the, 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 the contribution of the growth in the debate. But if we leave the growth out because we think it's politically unfeasible or right now it's not going to make headways into government or into Paris, precisely we don't challenge this. Uh, a uh, happy narrative, it's easy out there, and Richard Branson and Bill Gates will save the day with breakthrough te institute technologies, you know. Precisely, we need this argument. Actually, it's much more difficult than that, and it needs a system change. So, system change, we might argue, to what is system change? But at least we put this discussion on the forefront. If we completely avoid it, we say it's possible to have green growth, and it's possible to have just a change of technologies and continue with the system as it is, then we are killing this debate uh, from the beginning. If we think that this debate must be held, we have to take the radical position. If we already go with, uh, let's say, with a moderate position, then the radical discussion will never, will never start. Uh, we are not interested to talking about growth. No, I didn't. I didn't say that. So yes, I can't be misunderstood. You know, and I, I realize that sometimes I might contradict myself, which I don't think is bad. So I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about growth because I talked about growth like crazy. You know? I said we have to ruthlessly critique the idea of growth. And I'm not saying we should move beyond growth or beyond GDP. I don't think we can afford to move beyond growth and beyond GDP in a system that is structured to need and necessitate GDP growth and cannot do without it. So we have to confront it first as a criticism, and first and second as a thinking of alternatives. I'm not a partisan of avoiding the discussion of growth because I don't think you can avoid it. It's like so, so present that even if you avoid it, the system will not avoid it. GDP indicator is there, and it's there for a reason. We heard yesterday that it's part of a whole institutional system now that depends on it. So it's not just a matter of asking, oh, I'm not going to talk about GDP, or I'm going to ignore GDP. You might well ignore GDP, but it's going to still be there, and it's going to still drive many things. So you have to confront it. I make sometimes the analogy between atheist and agnosticist, you know? If you want to change, like for example, the religion was taught in schools and the evolution was not taught, you know, you have to confront that. You cannot say, you know, I'm agnostic, I don't know what's gonna happen, this can continue, and I'm not gonna be living God, or I'm not gonna be agnostic about it. No, you have to confront it. That's why I think the word degrowth is still important, it's confronted. <coughs> and the question of scale and decoupling. I wanted to make the same point, so I'm gonna go a little bit uh, around that. Yes, there is some absolute decoupling now. Not absolute. I mean, carbon emissions have not increased that <coughs> increased at a global level. But to get the type of reductions that we heard yesterday, 10 or 12 or 14 or 15 percent per year, if we want also a positive growth rate, we don't have any experience that this can happen. So in that sense, less growth will definitely make things easier. To claim that one or two years of just decoupling a little bit or decoupling in some countries is an evidence that the scale of the total decarbonization of the economy is possible, but I think it's still too <coughs> premature to make this, this call. Michael? Right. Well, a fantastic conversation. Um, and I suspect we're not going to have to, to have a go at this. So, um, really very interesting comments, um, a lot of which I'm going to uh, accept, I think. Um, so let's, uh, let me just clarify the, the point that Rupert asked about letting the cat out of the bag by saying that China's, uh, like the fact that China actually likely has a growth rate lower than its specific thing. Um, 
The reason I said that's a good thing is because, and I, I, I don't think he was letting the cat out of the bag, except that I'm happy to have the cat, or whatever the metaphor <laughs> is, I'm boasting about the cat, um, is because uh, the growth rate is, uh, is one thing which helps the economy if lots of other things are going in the right direction. And a high growth rate makes it harder for China to reduce emissions, that's the priority. So no question that actually if their economy is not growing as fast as we thought, that is making it easier for them to do that. I accept that completely because that's what the maths suggest. The question is whether that should be China's goal, whether China should be all focused on its rate of GDP growth. China, it seems to me, is not trying to do that, it's trying to lift people out of poverty, it's trying to change the structure of their economy, it's trying to reduce emissions, various other things, all of which have an impact on the growth rate, but they are not targeting a particular rate of growth. On the contrary, they are quite explicitly saying we need a slightly lower growth rate, partly because they don't want to export so much, they want to have more domestic consumption and so on. So China does seem to be moving into a world where it is not fixated on the growth rate. It's still got a growth rate, and it needs that because it wants more people to come out of poverty, but it's not its focus. It's not its focus on emissions, it's not its focus on welfare, it's not its focus on the structure of the economy. I think that's rather, uh, uh, rather interesting. So um, I have to vote about the CAT. Um, uh, the, how many countries will accept the reduced growth rate of the ones that have created this in Paris? Now this is, this is where the politics gets really interesting. Because um, I think it's without question true that countries have moved to a position where they can even talk about reducing their emissions, and countries are doing that, beginning plans in some cases, in some cases having quite well advanced to go for renewable energy because they found a discourse which is sufficiently <coughs> comfortable for them and which has sufficient <coughs> political support to enable them to go down that path. And I think green, that's what green growth has done. It has enabled that first moves in those directions to occur. Within that, of course, there's hypocrisy, there is complete lying about it, there is uh, people who, the wool is over, uh, they put the wool over their own eyes, of which Cameron and I suggest with one, they think it's easy, they think that Richard Branson and Google will solve the problem, that's ridiculous, and so on. So within that discourse, there's all kinds of positions, including people who don't really want it, to be perfectly honest. But I think the discourse has helped move the politics, and therefore the policy, and therefore actually what's happened quite a lot. But within that discourse, you then have to fight for the priority of climate over, over growth per se. And, and, and the fight is not won. Nobody has suggested, everybody on the green growth side says, oh, we've done it now. We've got a bit of emissions decoupling, so it's all fine. The fight is now massive, but it is a fight on territory where we have now got a chance of making progress. And my analysis of, the, of environmental politics is that for a long period, when environmentalists and people who, who supported growth of one kind or another in economic war on opposite sides, and Greens <coughs> were saying, you can't do these two things. If you want to protect the environment, you have to stop growth, get rid of the capitalist system. We lost. Long, long period, we did not affect policy except in very marginal areas where it was true, where actually you could get growth and so led in petrol and a few other things. We've only begun to impact on fundamental energy choices in the economy with this discourse and the coalitions that build around it. And now we're on the right territory, you can fight for the right outcomes within that territory. So that's my sort of kind of uh, political uh, analysis um, uh, uh, of this. The question of scale is critical, and I did say I would put it aside. I meant to come back to it. I didn't mean to put it aside in order to say it's not critical. And this is the weakest point in my argument. There's absolutely no question, I think, which is that um, the, uh, the scale of reduction of CO2 emissions is so great that it looks hard to sustain a growth rate, and while sustaining a growth rate, GDP, have emissions reducing, because the, the factors are just that much greater. So, it, I, and I accept that, and I, the, the rates of improvement of improvement over time are huge. The question is, does a green growth strategy get you closer to the possible outcomes, or does a degrowth strategy? That's the question we are facing here. And my view is a degrowth strategy is less likely to get you anywhere close to the kinds of investments that are needed to reduce emissions on any scale than a degrowth strategy, which I just don't believe. I don't believe if we try to do it, I think we would cause recession. I think it's very, very difficult to get rid of growth in a capitalist economy. And I think recession is very, very unlikely to do this. And I think politically, we wouldn't do it e easily. So in a sense, neither of us, it's quite possible that neither of us can meet the challenge. And that is because the challenge is now beyond our societies. And in many ways, the only way you can look at where we are today is that we are in an impossible situation. Two degrees is more or less impossible. And uh, and we just have to do the best we can to keep it as close to two degrees as possible. And the failure is not the failure today, it's the failure of the last 25 years when having the evidence we didn't do anything about it. And that can be true, 
but it can still leave a choice then, okay, in that situation, whose strategy is more likely to succeed? And um, my argument is my strategy is more likely to get us closer. And what we don't know is once you're set on that trajectory, what then can happen? And I, am, uh, I do think it's possible that you could get very rapid transitions once the trajectory is set. And the crucial point I'd make, I do sound like a technocrat, I realise that I come across as somebody who possibly does think it's all about Google and Richard Branson because I'm focused on the relationship between growth and environmental outcomes, and that growth is, it, it, it is easiest to express as a technological thing. I think it is deeply sociological, and we will need lots of social change as well, but technologies and <coughs> social change go together. So if you look at what's happening now in car, around cars, when I started doing environmental economics, there was a whole sustainable consumption movement which looked at cars and said, oh, cars are all this status symbol. We'll never get rid of cars because they're so sociologically embedded, particularly in male, male psyches, everybody likes a car. So when you look at young people now in cities, young people's um, desire to own cars is much, much less, and much less interested in cars as status symbol as they are in other things. Car use is radically changing now in cities with car <coughs> sharing and various other things. Those are sociological changes going along with business model changes, going along with technological changes. These things are absolutely intertwined. And if I sound like a technocrat, it's only because I'm trying to make the, the, the techn technical argument. But actually, these are deeply sociological, political changes. But don't think that you have to do all the lifestyle stuff first. But in some way, we have to change people's consumption desires before we can do anything. They go along with the technological change. These things happen in concert. So desires are changing as technologies change, as things become possible, as the social models change, and so on. These are intertwined. And, and then that takes us to the most interesting question, I think, which is the one that you raised, which is, are we not precisely living in a moment where radical change is even more possible? So in a sense, I heard the biggest critique about my life, and it was, it was a good one five years ago, or even three years ago, when the most we, it looked like it was going to be possible to do politically was the green mix, because there was a bit of support for that, and you could do it within a capitalist system, and so on. Are we now living in a moment post-Trump, post-Brexit, where much bigger opportunities are? <coughs> That's quite. That's a good. That's a very good critique, and I'm willing to concede that I'm absolutely willing to concede that um, that green growth of itself is now a very limited political project, and it is a political project which, in a sense, takes the urgency of the situation, the rather bad situation in terms of capitalism we're in, and says, okay, what's the best we can do to achieve what we need to do? And we might now be living in a different kind of world in which different things open up, including much more the kinds of things you're interested in, basic income and changing out and so on. So I think, uh, and so telling me I'm three years out of date now is I think the strongest argument, and I'm willing to have, I think we need a really good argument about how to do that, uh, to do that uh, in a political, uh, in the political context where we now are in. What I, uh, but I then return in my final book, Jonathan, I know you're right, is, is <coughs> what's this about? So how would you make the case for stronger change? And what would be your role for growth within it? And this is where I think post-growth is rather helpful, to be perfectly honest, and I think Rupert, I, I'm happy to use the term post-growth now. Um, because po post-growth implies two things. One is the period of fixation on growth is past. All the good things we want now are only tangentially, contingently related to growth. We need to focus on the good things. We need to focus on decarbonisation, environmental goods, well-being, social institutions, social solidarity, collectivism, rebuilding community, rebuilding a sense of democratic control over the economy. I would agree with all those things, and I suspect, I suspect there's quite a lot of agreement there, probably pretty much the same. So it's a much bigger project. And the relationship of growth to that is tangential, contingent, and not that interesting. Because let's go for those things, and then let's see what growth rate emerges as a result of it. And it may be negative, it may be just about positive, it may be a little bit more than positive, it'll go up and down, <coughs> but let's go for the things we really want to, including the sociological, the, soci the, the social relationships of changing uh, the system. Uh, so I would agree with that. And post-growth, in a sense, just says, that's the wrong framework for thinking about the things we now want. Don't fixate on it. Now that's where I would agree with you. It also does suggest and I think this is, I would also happy with this, that in a world of technological <coughs> constraints, um, we won't be going for fast growth because it makes it harder, and we will be going for slower growth rates, I think, They're even the best circumstances, think, and so on, and I think that's much more helpful than degrowth. What I don't agree with, and that's where I will maintain it, kind of, while wishing to compromise and come closer, is I don't think degrowth helps us in that political argument. I don't think it's a particularly helpful way of having those interesting arguments about the environment, about social relationships, about institutions, about democracy and control and so on. Because I don't think it's the most important thing. And in a sense, uh, it, it, it picks up 
the, the myth at the heart of capitalism and not, it, the, and not the real politics around it. I think the politics are elsewhere. But post-growth, I'm happy. Okay, so the, 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 we're having a great debate, but the bad news is it's 11 o'clock, we're getting into extra time. I've already got five questions uh, saved up here from people who had their hands up earlier. So let's take those as quickly and briefly as possible, and then hopefully we can have time to squeeze in a couple more questions. Okay, Ian. No, no, we've got another paper, so we'll stop oh, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I want to uh, speak in defence of, of my book for one reason, uh, which is that he speaks Thank about you. transitions. And um, I mean, this takes us back to on the left, uh, transitions from capitalism to socialism to the 70s and so forth, and the notion of revolutionary reforms and such things. And so that's what I like, the notion that uh, you have to build co class coalitions uh, within the present system in order to get change. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, it seems to me, Important, and that's why in my paper yesterday I was, I was trying to conceive of ways in which we could build up coalitions uh, around changing consumption patterns. Um, there's also good evidence on reduced working time, but that can be a successful transition. We shouldn't generalise from the Anglosphere countries where people want to work longer hours, and that's not true in many other countries. Incidentally, that's why I think <coughs> basic income is not a successful, a successful transitional strategy. It's a big pain. Uh, and that also ties in with the notion of varieties of capitalism. I do think uh, that uh, some varieties of coordinated capitalism can pursue this transition strategy better than others. The tragedy is, as most Naomi Klein says, it's a tragedy of that time that neoliberalism does seem to be dominant at the present time, and Wolfgang Streck is very pessimistic about it. But I think that's not going to be so there will be varieties of capitalism and therefore varieties of transition within a, within a green growth framework. Uh, Dominic. Can I ask a, a question, a more radical question about decoupling? So, so we believe that emissions have to go. So you mostly talk about reducing emissions, yet having less emissions, but we believe that emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, have to go down to zero pretty much about four or five decades. And does that, well, one question is, does that change the whole discourse between you? And personally, I believe it changes it in at least one way, because I believe the, the degrowth strategy um, has no hope of achieving zero emissions simply by degrowth. So even the degrowth strategy has to rely on the same technological innovation to get emissions down to zero. And if we have to do that <coughs> anyway, why spend so much energy then on the pushing deep road. <coughs> Chukka. Um, my problem is the, uh, the one that I read previously, which I think uh, Michael touches upon quite strongly, that um, I don't see much of a, a, a division of the intention of technical points made. It is more about strategy. And I'm, I'm both because of what Michael touched upon. So, there is a better strategy one to kind of frontally confront the new uh, economic model that we have, as uh, because appears to be suggested, and make this point in a very hard way that uh, business as usual, as if they cannot get us or tinker and imagine, cannot get us to where we want to go. Or are we better off with the strategy of finding where those points of coalitions may reside and trying to change the system from within as opposed from without? It seems to me that this is really the argument, as opposed to the more technical graph that we show. And I heard it also over and over <laughs> again saying that we need to confront the argument, we need to make it more powerful, we need to expose the, the fallacy of this uh, uh, you know, tinkering and imagining. And I heard uh, uh, Michael say, no, 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 we need to try and build coalition and work from the system and make and find from the general discourse of greed that is already established. I think this is the, the critical question and one that needs uh, much more attention. And then I was agreeing with Mike in the way that he was talking about the, 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 uh, the constitutive nature of ideas and the relationship between social construct and economy. And then he completely you know, lost my support when he said he's going to support post-growth, as if this argument is all about the developed countries. Uh, and we're talking of a system where at least three or four out of the 
the fastest growing in uh, carbon emitting countries are now in developing countries of people who absolutely need some form of growth. We're going to be finding them some people of, of green growth to, to really lead masses of the population out of poverty. So can you let me know how post-growth philosophy can address the needs of the TV population? Kevin. So my question, well, part of my question has been answered actually, but I do think in this in this day, area of climate change and arguing justice, if we are to be serious about our arguments, the eloquence of our arguments has to be buttressed with some numbers. Um, so, you know, Michael said not much reduced in Russia when they had the economic collapse. Well, the emissions went down by 43% in eight years. Not a bad reduction. Yeah. Um, uh, as I said it, I knew I was wrong, actually. Yeah, so thank right. you. Uh, okay. <laughs> the Paris agreed a phase out of fossil fuels. There's no reference in Paris to the term of fossil fuel. There was no agreement to phase out fossil fuels in Paris. There was an agreement to try and sort of establish some sort of uh, net reduction, in, uh, sort of net zero emissions towards the end of the century. So there's no agreement to phase out fossil fuels in Paris. The INDC, the pledges were more towards three to four degrees centigrade because they were like the Cameron view. We can tweak and fiddle around with this stuff. And the problem with the green growth debate is that has been the, the reason that we are in that position today because from Stern in 2006 onwards, we have had that incremental green growth. It'll be cheap, 1% of GDP by the end of the century sort of nonsense. And we have not actually been honest about this debate. Now we've come to a position where that's failed for over 10 years and you say, today, here, <coughs> 2 degrees C is almost impossible. So that's saying we are prepared to see the death of many millions of people, and that's the outcome of 10 years of rhetorical green growth nonsense. I'm also very concerned that we're, 2 degrees C is almost impossible, all we can do now is the best we can do. Now that is simply is not good enough. This is an existential problem. To say we're just going to do our best, we have to look at what, you, what is the scale of the challenge. And we have to be honest, because if we just say we're going to do our best from a mitigation point of view, that means we're sceptics, climate sceptics. Because the other people who are going to be impacted by climate change need to have some idea of what we're going to deliver, not as a goal or as a target, but as an obligation or as a duty. Because they need to know, do they have to live in a 3 degree C future, a 4 degree C future, or a 2 degree C future? These are fundamentally, profoundly different worlds. So we can tinker and muck around over here. But unless we provide some substance to our arguments and therefore to our action, then we are um, making the world an appalling place to live for many of the most impoverished people around the planet and future generations who have nothing to do with the scale of the challenge we face today. So we must move away from eloquence and rhetoric towards some substance in both our arguments and our action. And I didn't see that, certainly from Michael's position, and, uh, and partly from your position as well, where he seemed to also be saying that we've no real any chance of two degrees centigrade. So I'd like to some, some substance behind the argument. Dan? Yeah, thanks. Difficult to follow that, really. It is. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Sitting for my questions about fiscal surveillance, and I completely take this, but questions from Michael. I completely take on board what you say about, about the, the relevance of green growth discourses in, in Westminster and Whitehall with your experience, and I'm quite sure that's been true to date. Uh, my question really is about though, whether post growth ideas can uh, gain political salience or, and under what conditions. Uh, and I'm particularly thinking of the Eurozone right now, which has already had massive problems, quote unquote, with economic growth, um, which aren't environmental so much as, as to do with productivity and to do with the fact that fiscal policy is kind of precluded by the fiscal compact uh, and monetary policy is completely controlled by the ECB. Uh, and so there's, there's an awful lot of people writing about secular stagnation now, but a prolonged slump in economic growth. Uh, uh, and these aren't radicals either, we're talking about people like Paul Krugman and, and Larry Summers and Mark Lyde and, and so forth. Um, and this is, I think, where I, I agree with Jürgen's point before, uh, in, in relation to, to your question. Uh, I don't think growth is just an output, it's, it's a systemic imperative. Um, and when we, uh, and when the system isn't functioning as it's supposed to, it creates a, a whole host of political symptoms. So I do wonder, in that kind of context, uh, would, would post-growth ideas gain a certain degree of Yes. Um, the zero emissions, it's really important. Okay, so the argument, I think we heard the same argument yesterday. <coughs> if we have to go down to zero emissions, definitely, even with or without growth, we would need to have some kind of important uh, substitution of energy sources, uh, change of technology that we produce energy, etc. <coughs> so if we are to do that, why not do it with growth? Uh, we know also how it works and try to do it 
also in an economy that's changing. Because anyways, we cannot get the economy of GDP down to zero in order to get carbon emissions down to zero. That's the argument, okay? Stern, for example, in his report, and I saw this uh, cited in an article by Kevin, said that anything, anything like more than 4% reductions of carbon emissions per year would definitely would not be compatible with growth. Like we've seen in historical areas, whenever it has happened, it has also been with negative growth, okay? We don't know an economy, we, I mean, we can imagine and we can do sketches, but we don't know, and I believe <coughs> it's not possible to have an economy that it's completely is not using fossil fuels, it's not using solar and wind, and it's at the same scale as the current economy or is it growing even more? It's two times bigger in 35 years and four times bigger in 70 years. So all I'm arguing is that the two things have to go together and we have to think of the two things together. Smaller economy and different in terms of its technological and energy production needs. So for me, I don't see it that, it that it will be possible to have an economy that doesn't use any fossil fuels and that this will happen in 30 years, plus this economy will keep growing. Okay, so how, how much and how it will change is a different, it's a, it's a different question, but that's, that, that's the argument, okay? I'm not saying that the economy should go down to 0% so that there are zero, zero, zero carbon emissions. Um, lifting masses out of poverty. Yes, uh, this, is, this is an important discourse, but it's a discourse that has continued and it's reproduced over and over to justify also the, the need for economic growth. First of all, if you want, let's leave out, sorry, I, I don't see you. We can leave out the question of developing countries and agree that at least a change of the economy and the scale of the economy and a change and transformation of the, of the type of economies and societies we have in the <coughs> global north is necessary. So if we agreed on that, then we can discuss also what it would mean for the rest of the world. But I don't think we have an agreement on that one either, okay? I don't think there is an argument for our part of the world to keep growing at two or three percent per year in order to help to lift the masses out of poverty in the rest of the world. <laughs> there is no argument for that, and we didn't and we didn't grow because of growth in the rest of the world. So to argue that we do it out of charity is, I think, it's a little bit of a disingenuous argument. Now, what about the rest of the world? I think uh, Julia's research yesterday or Ian's research yesterday uh, shows that it's not necessarily only through growth that we can have some type of human development in the rest of the world. So we have to break this necessary association between growth and, uh, and, uh, and human development. So there are many other trajectories that perhaps could be feasible or sustainable for the very poor countries to read a mid-level, a, mid, a, a kind of uh, the social conditions that mid-level income countries have today and which are more or less uh, sustainable, socially sustainable and to some extent ecologically sustainable. So we have to break also this mold of thinking of cuts up and becoming exactly like the rich countries today because this never stops, no? The rich countries get richer to help the poor countries which are getting richer to cut up with the richer countries. You know, this is an endless, an endless circuit at some point it has, it has to, to, to stop. Um, and I, I would be a little bit more critical also of this discourse coming out from uh, the so-called developing world. A friend of mine visited Brazil and he stayed in the house of a professor there and he said he lived 10 times better than a professor in, uh, in, Europe, li in Europe lives. Not least because everything, all the care work in his house was done by paid help. So everything was done by others, you know. So that's how <laughs> the middle class lives in the, rest, in the rest of the world, in the developing world. So I think also this whole discourse, the rest of the world has to grow, etc., uh, generalizes something that it's not like that. And there are huge inequalities within these countries, and there is a, a very big and growing middle class that's living better than the middle class here, where our standards are shrinking, and they have to take also care of their responsibility. So I think that just generalizing and talking about poor countries in general is a, is a little bit, can be misleading. It can also be stopping progressive change that is also uh, to take place in this place. For example, in India, there was also <coughs> always a discourse, a Gandhian discourse that was critical of this idea of uh, continuous economic growth and wanted a different model for India. I think that the growth discourse fits with this type of radical discourses, left green discourses within also developing uh, world countries. Final point that I forgot to make about compound growth and about capitalism. So the only problem is not climate change. Compound growth, I think, is an illogical, it's, a, it's an illogical proposition in many other different terms. So the idea that also the GDP economy, even if we're assuming that it could be slightly de or dematerializing, that it could grow at 3% per year to infinity, it still seems to me illogical. David Harvey, in his last book, the 17, or I don't know how many contradictions of capitalism, he had as the main contradiction of capitalism the, the requirement for a compound rate of growth. 
and he made some calculations. Again, whenever you make these calculations, you see the impossibility. You're saying how many trillions would have to constantly fund new outlets of investment for the capital system to keep growing at a rate of two or three percent. I mean, this is a different argument. It's the argument that uh, we are then bound to face more and more of the periodic crisis that we are experiencing here as capital gets bigger and bigger and bigger and has to find more and more demand and it's harder to find it. So the idea that this, again, this dynamic, and forget now the resource limits, okay, that this dynamic can continue to infinity, I think it's also very problematic. At some point this system will crash. It will crash because of ecological limits, it will crash because of its own contradictions, it will crash. Can we make this crash in a socially transformative way or are we going to go together with it? I think we are more likely to go together with it, but we have to find for, for the other. Um, <coughs> okay, so um, Dan, was it? Yeah. Um, your uh, point linked to Ian. So, uh, and, uh, and just picking up on the, on the final point. So I think we're in an interesting moment. I think capitalism is in multiple crises right now. Um, and uh, and that has led to the political uh, tremendous problems in the Eurozone, to Brexit, to Trump. Uh, and I think this is a very interesting moment, um, politically and, and economically. In, I'm going to give a little plug to my new book with Marianne Mazzucato, Rethinking Capitalism. We, we try and address the multiple crises of capitalism in that, and particularly the economics that you need to address them. So I think this is a moment for radical thinking. Um, and I think this is both about the way we think about the way economic policy and about the political, um, as, as Ian puts it, the, tr the coalitions, the transitions that you build and what you're transitioning to. So I think that's tremendously fertile territory. Uh, the one thing I would say within this that relates this back to the kind of environmental conversation we've had here is don't forget the environmentalism within that. Because much of those crises and the resistance to them are not actually very particularly green. Um, because people's priorities are different and so on. So um, uh, even within a kind of socialist, um, uh, social radical movement, there is a risk that the environmental thing is slightly lost because that's not the strongest thing that is motivating much of the resistance, it's one of them. And even while we're transitioning to a kind of softer capitalism with a, with a more active state and more socially just and various other things, if we don't deal with our carbon emissions and if we don't get the shift to renewable energy much going much quicker and so on and so forth, we won't have solved this crisis. We might have got a more socially benevolent climate crisis. Um, and that's why, in a sense, the, the just making sure that we are, uh, we are making that argument is, uh, it remains uh, very important. But I think there's lots of interesting things going, going on there. Chucky, you, are, you correctly took it to grasp about post-growth in developing countries. And here I d d disagree. Um, I think developing countries need growth. They need income growth because incomes make people uh, unequivocally better off. Uh, lots of things uh, wrong with the ways in which you generate that income in many ways, but nevertheless, they absolutely, and it is, it's quite unconscionable to, to say, uh, so post-growth is a developed world um, uh, concept only. Um, uh, there are different development models, there are different ways of growing, but they all have growth, they all have growth of incomes uh, in them for developing countries. I think that, is, uh, that has to be uh, uh, accepted, even though we can then imagine different development models within that. Um, uh, the emissions needing to go down to zero is, I think, a really critical uh, point, and I would rather agree with your critique of degrowth, which is, I think, uh, it's very hard to see how a degrowth strategy on its own, at least, is, is that, and in that sense, we completely agree, I think, which is that we both believe, understand, that emissions have to go to zero as rapidly as it is possible to do. And to do that, we need more investment in, in a whole variety of things, but many of which are technological. Um, and my argument is that to get that investment flowing as fast as possible, uh, a degrowth political discourse is not very helpful, whereas I think a green growth one is more helpful. But that's absolutely where we, we need to go. And then that brings us to the, to the big challenge um, which comes uh, from Kevin. Um, so I don't think it's true to say that the Russian numbers are wrong. I completely accept that. But as I said that sentence, I, said, I, I realize that was not true. Um, but I also don't think the, perhaps the Russian economy is a particularly good model of degrowth. It caused immense hardship, tremendous poverty, and Putin. Uh, and so as a, I mean, in a sense, although the numbers are completely wrong, uh, the argument as that is a kind of degrowth strategy. And that is the risk, obviously, of a kind of strategy focused on degrowth, which is that you get massive recession, because that's the best way of engineering degrowth in the There may be much better ways. I'm not clear what they are now. But your real challenge, I think, 
is a very interesting one, and I want to pass it back to you. Um, which is, we do have to do something incredibly difficult. Um, and uh, the, the numbers you put forward are broadly correct. I think there is some, but I'm happy to accept them. Um, the question is, how do we, what, what does that leave us with morally, which is the point you raised, and then how are we most likely to do that? The question of morality, and you know, you made quite an accusation there that I'm happy to see millions of people die. No, I'm not. I'm not happy about that. But many of those people are going to die now and are already dying in the world that we've already got. And so we're all more, more anybody who's been an adult for the last 25 years shares in the moral culpability of the failure to do that. And that is no more, no less than the moral culpability that we will have over the next 25 as we probably. Now, that is, all of the, and, and, two, and two degrees, as you well know, is not good enough. Two degrees isn't good enough. Because one and a half degrees, as we know, as, a, as the islands are telling us, will mean the end of people's life living on, on parts of the world. So this is, all a, this is all morally awful. And we should be trying to minimise it. And so my question back to you, which is the one that I'm trying to address, is what is our best route doing that, or to doing as much of it as is possible. And I do believe that doing as much of it as possible is much better, is, is a proper strategy, and it's not as good as doing all of it, or doing even more, but it is a proper strategy, and it's not a proper strategy to say, let's go for perfection in rhetoric, in, in claim, and then achieve less than the best we can do, which is the position that I said that you didn't like. So, we, so my, and this is a question back to you, Kevin, and to everybody else, which is, what is the best way of doing <coughs> the most we can do to reduce those climate impacts, given the numbers? And you say that the last 10 years, based on the stern view, have been a failure. Absolutely, they've been a failure relative to the scale of the problem. They've been more successful than the previous 15. And so, yes, I accept we haven't done enough. That discourse has not done nearly enough. It's still not doing enough. You can get away under the green growth rubric of doing bugger all, which in many places is <coughs> What is our most likely strategy for impacting this incredibly imperfect and, and morally repugnant world that we currently face? And if you can come up with an alternative set of policies and the political strategy and the coalitions that build those political strategies, not just on paper, but into action, into actual things that happen in the world, not that might happen in the world that we invent, in the actual world, then I will come and join you with it. And what I'm saying is the things that I've seen that seem to work best in this world have this around the green growth discourse. I'm absolutely going to change. You can find me a better one. And that looks more likely to work. I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to stop. John's told me that we are beyond extra time. Um, that was a great discussion, so thank you. Thank you.